Hello and welcome back to Get Up and Game. My name is Josh and apparently I am going to continuously continue the deck building series that I thought I had completed. Funny story, when I originally filmed the video that you saw last time, the third part of the deck building series with all the deck building demonstrations, I ended up filming just so many examples and I really took my time explaining everything and it turned out that it was going to be a two hour or longer video and I knew I couldn't have that but I went and joked around about that on my community tab on YouTube. And after I made that post, I went back and refilmed that video. I tried to speak a little more quickly and I did fewer deck building examples to try to keep the video length more reasonable. Now it still ended up being a little over an hour, but that was about as short as I could get it. And when I went back to that community post, a few people very kindly suggested that they would be more than happy to watch a much longer video about this topic. And among all those very nice comments, one really made me laugh out loud. It said, hashtag release the gug cut, a funny reference to the whole Justice League Snyder cut thing. Uh, so, you know, I thought, why not? If there's even just a few people out there that wanna see a few more deck building examples, it's totally worth the time to finish putting that one together. And it actually really worked out because there were other things I had planned on talking about in the third video. I, I didn't talk about them in the first two because I was saving them for the third. And then the deck building stuff just took longer than I thought it was going to. So I never got to those topics. So for the sake of completion and in an effort to add value to this one, in addition to a few more deck building examples, I'm also going to do an overview of the basic cards, similar to how I did with the aspect cards in the second video. And I'm also going to talk more about the role of allies in deck building. That was something else I never really got to get too deep into in the previous three videos. So we're going to talk about that stuff. And then at the end, I'll have four more deck building examples that I had originally filmed. And some of it might be similar content to what was in the first deck building video. I might have I said a few similar things and stuff like that. But I, I try to cut out as much that you've already seen as possible. But it, you know, it is a director's a cut, an extended edition, if you will. So there's gonna be a little bit of redundancy, but I, I cut out as much of it as I could. So hopefully this will all be very interesting to you. And I'm pretty sure this will be the last video about deck building. I'm really excited to move on to the next topic, which is going to be modular encounter sets, but you know, one more time around, right? All right, let's start talking about basic cards. So when it comes to the basic part of the card pool in Marvel Champions, it's really there to serve two purposes. One, it's to provide generically useful things that aren't necessarily thematically tied to any of the aspects, as well as giving deck building options that are gonna be useful for every deck that they didn't want to be tied to an aspect, so you would always be able to use them no matter what color of deck you're building. So for example, you know we have the double resources that are just infinitely useful that you're pretty much always gonna use in almost every single deck. You know, it would've been a real shame if these were tied to a certain aspect. And then they actually went ahead and came out with the power in all of us in the Wasp pack. And this is just fantastic because we're going to see a lot of incredibly useful basic cards that cost two or more. And, you know, if you get seven or eight of those in your deck, these become very worthwhile to include just to help pay for some incredibly powerful effects. Now, there is definitely some talk about whether or not this is too good, too universally useful, and that could be true of basic in general. There are a lot of cards here that see a lot of play. You know, I'm not here to say whether or not that's good or bad. It could potentially affect variety, but that also is up to you to decide if you want to include Nick Fury in every single deck like maybe I do. But you know, you don't have to if you don't want to. You are free to make those choices. So it does limit creativity to some degree, but only if you let it, I think. And then the only other basic resource that we've seen so far is an interesting card that came with Nova, this everyday hero and idea that if you're playing sort of in multiplayer, you can actually use this to spend for another player. And you actually have to heal a damage from them. This isn't a card I've used much, but mostly just because I don't play a lot of multiplayer. I think this could be a fun option, but it's, it's tough too when you go to include resource cards in your deck. You don't want to include too many. You know, you want the cards that you draw to actually do something. So you have to be really picky about the ones that don't provide double resources. So I don't I don't know if I would play this card, even if I did play a lot of multiplayer, but, but it's a neat idea, and I'm glad they're doing things like this. Now, when it comes to the basic events, I find, for the most part, they are definitely less exciting than some other elements of basic. In the early days, they were largely here just to provide necessary effects to aspects that didn't have access to those, like Emergency here reduces the amount of threat when a villain schemes. 
So if you're playing one of the aspects that's not very good at thwarting, you know, you can still put these in there to sort of help. Same with Haymaker, it does a little bit of damage for a decent cost. So if you're playing, say, Protection that didn't have good access to medium damage, Haymaker was a way to fill in that gap. And with a small card pool, cards like this can still be very useful. They're not they're not really into bad. They 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 work within the math of the game to provide a, an effect that is worth paying for. It's just that they're not particularly exciting. And nowadays, if you have a larger card pool, you know, these have all largely been replaced. But I still kind of want to go through them. First Aid's a pretty decent card. Heal two damage from any character. This can actually still be pretty nice in strategies that revolve around playing a particular ally. Now, if you're playing in protection, you know, med team's probably a better option. And there are a couple other cards, but... You know, if you're not playing protection, that's the point of these basics. You know, you still have access to this. So that's pretty cool. Vulnerability actually gets some new life with Colossus. Three for a tough is a fair price. But there's a lot of other ways to sort of either just avoid taking damage or some or some aspects have cards that will provide tough at a cheaper price. And that's, that's just the big... That's always going to be a big theme with basic. For the most part, the cards are not over-costed. But this is probably the average price. But then when you get to the aspect, those cards are going to be a little better. And then when you get to the hero cards, those cards are going to be even more a little better. So by the time you get down to the basic card that does a certain effect, it starts to feel like it's too expensive. Warning is another card that saw some new life with Ghost Spider. If you're not playing her in protection, this is a nice way to trigger her during the defense phase. So it's an okay card spending one card to produce to reduce damage by one. But the fact that it can trigger other effects with certain heroes is pretty cool. To the Rescue is a card that simply removes two threat for two. I feel like you'd have to be pretty hurting for threat removal options before you go to this card. But, you know, it's there if you absolutely need it. Earth Minded Heroes is a really cool card if you're playing Avengers. This is a great way to keep readying your hero. There's a lot of fun strategies with this. Hawkeye to shoot more arrows. Doctor Strange to cast more spells. Spider Woman with her boosted stats being able to ready over and over. This is a fantastic basic card. And again, it's nice. that It's it's gray. You can use it in any aspect deck, so it doesn't really matter. And it can still work for you. Assess the Situation is a card I kind of talk about a lot, so I don't want to go too much into it here. But I think it's really cool in certain situations. Small hand size heroes seem to make good use of this. Or if I'm playing a deck that is trying to do one very specific thing and I don't really care about the aspect cards, I just want to draw the cards for the combo, then I'll play these. And then instead of drawing a card I don't really care to play, I can just ditch this and the next turn I have an extra card. Certainly not an every deck card. It's kind of weird, but it definitely has its uses. Athletic conditioning, the fact that discards a center confuse from your hero as an event, you, know, you have to have it in your hand at the right time. And it'd probably be better just to exhaust your hero. This is If this were an upgrade, it would be okay. Now, beat him up, dealing one damage to the villain, and each minion engage with you for two. In certain scenarios, this is actually pretty good. I don't play it a lot, but I could see it getting some use. It's also nice to knock toughs off. I can see, uh, you know, if you're playing a certain scenario where a lot of the enemies get tough, this is a pretty easy way to just knock them all off. Could see some play. Spiritual Meditation, auto-include if you're playing Mystics. And this is where we start to get where Basic kind of took a turn. So we've already sort of seen all the major effects that the game needs. We're preventing damage, we're removing threat, we're getting some readying. And then basic really takes a turn. We saw some of the Earth's Mightiest Heroes. It starts to become the home of the trait-specific effects. And again, that's nice because it's not tied to an aspect. So no matter what color I'm playing Scarlet Witch in, I'm always going to be able to take Spiritual Meditation. Again, does that cut down on the creativity a little bit? Yes, because I'm always putting three of these in there. But, you know, the card's so fun to play, I, I think that's a small price to pay. And I think it's a really good design for the game to always have access to these types of effects, no matter... You know, the aspect is already limiting you to 25% of the rest of the card pool, so it's nice to have some staples that you can rely on. So we see that recuperation, healing damage from your Ultra Eagle equal to your recovery for two... Is just so expensive for the healing. Even with someone like Wolverine or Spider Hand, it's going to be five or six. I don't know if I would want a card in my deck that does that. So I've never used that, but maybe if you comboed it with downtime in Wolverine, a way to heal eight could be good. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm ready to try that. Now, Hit and Run is a really good card if you're Gamora, deal two damage to an enemy, and remove two threat from a scheme. For three, that might be decent even in some other heroes. Now, it triggers her special abilities. It came with her. But it's attack and thwart traded, so if you have 
cards that trigger off those or help pay for those types of things, that also helps. But three is kind of a lot to pay, but it does a decent amount of work. This gives the deck some versatility. So a one or two of, of this in some decks might actually be pretty good. Godlike Stamina, this is more uh, trait specific. Uh, really helped out the Asgard trait. Heal two damage from your identity and discard a status card. This is really nice for Valkyrie and Thor that they can really be hampered by stun and they want to be tanks. They already have a lot of health and this just allows them to just take hits and keep going. So I really like this card. And then we ran into the Alliance cards that being primarily a solo player, I haven't played much of. But these are an interesting concept and this was the basic one that lets you ready a Guardian and an Avenger character. But three is kind of a lot to just ready two different characters, especially the timing of it could be weird depending on the turn order, but you know, it's there if you need it. Reboot's really good if you're playing with androids, so basically Vision, <laughs> but it's a pretty cool card. But it's, it's amazing that we have cards, you know, we're pretty later into the card pool. I, I put these in the order they were released. You know, now we're to what came out with Mad Titan Shadow and these cards are getting really, really specific. So this works on Vision, Vivian, Victor Mancha, and Machine Man, and that might be about it. Uh, well, there's a couple more, but yeah, Jocasta and Protector. So, yeah, I guess there are a decent... If you really want to build an Android deck, this is this is the way to go. Another great card that came with Vision was Meditation. This is a really cool effect to have a basic be able to use in any deck. allows you to exhaust your Alter Ego to play a card for three less. For some heroes, this is just incredibly, incredibly useful. So I was really happy when this card came out. I used this quite a bit when it was new. This pile's getting big. Okay. Go for Champions, probably the strongest, most broken, silly card in the whole game that just prevents all damage to Champion characters. So you almost wish this was maybe limited to protection so it wasn't quite so easy access, but it is what it is, and so that's there if you want to use it. And again, we're just very, very specific at this point. These are the newest cards to come out, and they really only work for a handful of decks. Cross the Spider-Verse lets you get your Web Warriors out. Limitless Stamina only works for the heroes with 14 printed hit points which is like four or five, six of them. But it's incredibly, incredibly useful. And I'm going to stop saying this will be the last time, but it sure is nice that you can use it in any deck because it's just so you know universally useful. This is a ubiquitously useful card that you're going to want in pretty much every Thor deck and every She-Hulk deck and every SPDR deck, and it'll always be there for you. And then Game Time is the newest one that came out that's uh, currently limited to the X-Men. Choose an ally with a training upgrade attached. They're the only ones that have training upgrades that we've seen so far. Ready that ally and heal one damage from it. So for zero, you basically get a free use out of an ally that has an upgrade on it. So it's going to be particularly effective. So that's a really cool card. So when it comes to the basic events, I find most of them to be mediocre to bad. But, you know, depending on your card pool, some of them can be really nice. And then the ones that really work well are usually the ones that work specifically for a team. You know, I often consider those when I'm building for a team, you really want to keep an eye on all the cards that mention your your trait. They're probably going to be pretty useful, uh, and especially the newer ones. These have definitely gotten a lot better, the team-specific ones. Go for Champions is obviously awesome, and limited list stamina game time. So basic events, I skip most of them, but there are a few, and there are some others too. And I'm glad I got a chance to go over these basic cards because I sort of completely forgot these existed. <laughs> When I was doing my deck building examples, you know, was not, when I was building that protection Ant-Man deck for multiplayer, if I had remembered that there was such a thing as Swarm Tactics, I would have at least mentioned it. That, you know, if you're playing a multiplayer game, these can be really nice if one of the other players is Wasp. Now, these do tend to, these do still work with your signature ally. You know, if you're playing Ant-Man, you get Wasp on the table. You can play this one, change your other hero form, ready your hero. These are all pretty good effects. I just don't typically use them in solo, so I sort of forgot they existed. But so it started with Ant-Man and Wasp, and the fact that it lets you change your form and ready is actually super, super useful. And then Order and Chaos came with Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver that lets you cancel a one result effect and deal two damage. These are just really fun, you know, thematically, and I'm super glad they exist. There are some challenges with them that you, you know, you both have to be in hero form. You have to happen to have the card at the right time, you know, stuff like that. But they're definitely worth including, at least for the fun of it. Then we have Flora and Fauna that works for Groot and Rocket. That either gives Groot a couple more growth counters and readies him or puts two charge counters on a Rocket upgrade and readies that. So that's a really, really good one if you're playing those two heroes. Daughters of Thanos is one of my favorites for Nebula and Gamora. 
largely because I'm a huge Nebula fan. I like to play her quite a bit, and I really like getting Gamora out. So this is one I actually do play in solo. I, I wouldn't probably play any of the rest of these so far. But, yeah, I definitely like to include a copy of this. You know, you get to draw three cards. Now, it's really only netting one card because you pay the cost of this plus you're playing this. So you're spending two cards to draw three, but that's, that's a trade I'll take all day. I, I think I really like this card. Two against the world. I never play Iron Man or War Machine, so I've probably never even played this, but it's definitely really good. The fact that it searches for a tech upgrade and puts it into play. You know, three is expensive, but just paying the cost of the upgrade and finding it, so it's totally worth it. And this I find very interesting. Ready Iron Man and War Machine. I've seen a lot of people a little unhappy with this card because it's difficult to get the most out of this. You know, you really want to be readying Iron Man and War Machine, but see, I don't, I guess I don't see it that way. It's nice if you can get both of them, but I think for what it already does, and then it's going to ready, you know, whoever's playing it basically, right? If you're Iron Man, you're playing this card, you're going to make sure that it readies you. I think it doesn't need to ready both of them to have been worth playing. I think that's kind of a trap sometimes we see with cards and games like this, if you can't get all the benefits of the card, then it's not as good. But I don't think it's necessary to, to get both readies out of this and for it to still be plenty good. You know, you see something like that and then it's disappointing that it doesn't work out. But like I said, I think that's a bit of a trap and we need to just realize that readying one of them is still really good along with what it's doing. Young Love, I find to be one of the weakest ones. Simply healing one, healing three damage from Gwen and Miles. You know, if it's both heroes... You know, that's certainly pretty good for one, and they both could use the help with health. But certainly if you're playing with allies, you know, one's the hero, one's the ally, it's, you know, healing the ally for a little bit, it's probably not going to be that big of a deal. So this is definitely one I've not really ever bothered to play with. And now we get to the new ones, the X-Men. You know, we already, we've only seen one, we've seen about four or five of them leading up to the X-Men, and then we've already seen four new ones with the X-Men, so they're definitely leaning into it a lot harder these days, which is cool. We get the Kitty and Colossus one. When an enemy attacks, prevent all damage and deal four damage to the enemy. That's That one's really, really good. Preventing all the damage for two is already decent for a basic card. You know, usually cards like that for heroes only cost one, but still for basic two is pretty fair. And you also get four damage back. You know, it might even take out a minion, which would be nice. Psychic Rapport with Cyclops and Phoenix, similar to the Iron Man and War Machine one. It readies both of them, but Unless one of them happens to be the ally, it's probably only going to be one or the other. And then this one's kind of weird because it says to choose to either return a Cyclops card from your discard pile to your hand or place two power counters on Phoenix Force. Now, if you're playing Phoenix, you know, you can't return a Cyclops card from your discard pile to your hand. But they did say in a playthrough video of all places that this really was meant to be a choice. So if you're Phoenix and you play this card, you can have Cyclops return a card from his discard pile to his hand, even though that's really clearly not how the card is worded. So, you know, if you didn't happen to hear about that one time they said that in that one place, there you go, now you know. Uh, and Soul Sisters we have for Phoenix and Storm, heal two damage from each of them. This one is similar to the Young Love where it's providing healing, but at least this one also provides some readying. Even if it only ends up readying one or the other, still pretty good for one. And obviously the best team up that there will ever be is Fastball Special. The fact that it allows you to deal X damage to an enemy where X is a total attack of Colossus and Wolverine with Overkill and Piercing. At the very least, this card is going to do five damage, probably six, and possibly more for only one with Overkill and Piercing. And obviously the thematically, it's just so, so, so much fun. So I might not play a lot of the team up cards, but this is one I'll definitely be playing every single chance I get. And certainly we'll be seeing one for Gambit and Rogue as well, so that will be very cool. Now when it comes to the upgrades, it's a pretty mixed bag, similar to how the events were. You know, you get some very basic effects like Tenacity, and then you get some really specific effects with the honorary cards that you can put it on a friendly character so you can attach it to a hero or an ally to give them the Avenger trait. And it does give them plus one hit point, which is fine, but you're usually doing it for the trait so that you can do some sort of team-up shenanigans that you wouldn't normally be able to do. So this is the very type of thing that basic exists for. It's nice that this card exists for when you want to use it, but you wouldn't really want this taking up the aspect slot in a pack that could be a much, much more useful card. So these cards are good to have, even if they're not going to be used all that often. And then we got a round of these enhanced cards where they provide resources you're basically paying three resources to then later gain three resources 
but they are of a specific type. So if you're playing a hero or a strategy that's really looking for mental resources, for example, like maybe for Wasp or Ironheart, and you're turning, you know, three whatever resources now into three future guaranteed mental resources. So these cards are, are so-so. If you do use a power in all of us to play it, then you get a little bit extra value out of it. I don't use these cards a lot, but it, again, it's nice that they're in the card pool if you do need them for very specific builds. You know, not every deck has to be super tightly efficient. Some decks can just be for fun. And these can be really nice for certain, you know, for fun strategies that might just be a little kooky and just really need a very specific thing to happen. Then you have access to these cards and there's one for each type of resource. And then in the middle, we also got Endurance, which this is such a fantastically useful card for one cost. You get plus three hit points. You can even play it under other players' control. So a multiplayer, you want to pack a deck full of them and you pass them out to a couple other people. And basically for one, those three extra hit points equate to sort of taking an undefended attack from the villain. So this kind of plays like a defense event where you get to survive one more hit from the villain. So I, I tend to, I very often tend to use endurance and we have the rest of these enhanced reflexes. The other side of endurance is downtime, increasing your recovery by two. This is a card I never ever play. I do not, I do not like exhausting to recover unless I absolutely have to. So I don't really plan for it to the point where I would put a card in my deck. Uh, I don't know how the community feels about this card, actually, but it's not something I particularly like. More enhanced stuff. Target Acquired is a very interesting card that came with Black Widow that I actually really like in certain scenarios. This is one of those, just one more thing that Basic kind of does for you, is it covers your bases for specific situations. In this case... It's if you're going up against a villain with particularly annoying boost effects, then packing some of these might be quite nice. You know, you take it with Ronin to guarantee he doesn't get that universal weapon back right away. You know, this could stop a Goblin Thrall from popping out during Mutagen Formula. So for one resource, you basically kill the Goblin Thrall, things like that. This is actually a pretty useful card. And the fact that it's an upgrade is nice versus an event. You get it on the table and then it's ready for when you need it. Now, Espionage is a weird card. Play, if you only, play only if you control a spy character. When the surge keyword on an encounter card will be resolved, discard it to draw two cards. So you're basically paying two resources to hopefully in the future draw two cards back. Now, in Black Widow, this card's incredible because she can fetch it from the discard pile with the safe house. She can play it with a gauntlet for free. It could potentially help pay for Winter Soldier. And she likes to be an Alter Ego a lot anyway, which is where Surge happens very frequently. There are many, many encounter cards that Surge when you're Alter Ego. So this card is amazing for Black Widow. And she's obviously a spy, so can play it. Outside of her, I've never found much use for this. But if you are playing a all Alter Ego deck, like maybe Cyclops has a really good all Alter Ego build. I've played Wasp that way. There are certainly ways to do it then this is an interesting card to consider because if you're playing an all alter ego deck, there's a lot of cards you're not going to be able to play anyway if you're never planning on being in hero form, or at least rarely. So there's only so many cards you can put in your deck that work well when you're in alter ego. And so this just helps you filter through your deck faster. So this has its very specific uses. Now you have to be a spy to play it, so you're probably going to use, we're going to talk about him later, Agent Coulson is kind of the, the key spy to playing cards like this. There's a few others, but he, he works because he can fetch this for you. So this is one of those incredibly specific cards, but I always found it very interesting. Sorcerer Supreme, obviously an auto clue if you're a mystic. Resourceful is kind of like those enhanced cards, but you're paying one to just get one back. You're turning sort of two resources now into one wild resource later. That doesn't seem like a good trade most of the time, but what I do like about it is it has the wild resource icon. So I've used this in Venom decks before and just planned on discarding it from my hand as a wild resource to help pay for some of his effects. Nova could make use of this as well. And there's an argument to be made that if you just have a couple cards left in your hand that you can't play, then you know you put this down and then it's there for you when you need it in the future. But eh, it's, it's okay. And we have Civic Duty and Adrenaline Rush that came with Quicksilver. These are really fun cards in very specific builds that they sit on the table and then you can pop them later to give you plus one thwart until the end of the phase or plus one attack. So if you're playing a hero like Quicksilver or Captain America, Spider-Woman, SPDR, somebody who can ready a lot, you know, you want to build up a big table of these and just pop them all and then just go nuts, just ready over and over and over. That, that can be a very specific build. So this is a rare case where basic actually sort of provides a whole deck theme. You don't see a lot of that in basic, but it exists there. 
Death Focus, incredible, incredible card for the heroes that can take it, which is pretty much all the X-Men these days, but Groot, Spider-Woman, Quicksilver. There are a lot of heroes that have a ton of superpower cards, and this helping to pay for them. This is an auto-include for many heroes. Booster Boots is an underrated card, I think, for Guardians. I don't hear much about this, but you, you, know, you put one in your deck, you get it out, and then it's going to prevent one damage for you every villain phase. You have to discard the top card of your deck, but I don't think that matters most of the time. So, you know, it basically increases your defense by one, you know, in sort of a weird way. So I actually quite like Booster Boost, and I use it often in Guardians decks. Pulse Grenade isn't one I've used a lot, but can be potentially cool, where you discard the top two cards from an encounter deck and deal damage equal to the boost icons. If you've ever played with Wiccan, you know that they will always be zero. But the nice thing about this one is that it's a weapon, and so it works with some of the aggression cards that will trigger off having a weapon. So that's still nice that it has that utility. Side Holster, very, very specifically useful card for pretty much Rocket Venom, and I don't know who many, who else wants extra restricted keywords, but if you need them, you've got them with a Side Holster, and at least it costs zero. Another potential use of Side Holster is cards like this can be kind of nice to protect the rest of your board from effects like Caught Off Guard or the Reality Stone, you know. You can just have a zero-cost side holder holster to discard. I don't know if that's worth a slot in your deck, but, you know, it's something to do with it. Plasma Pistol is pretty good. It's a little costly, but, you know, you pay two to get it out, and then it's going to let you ping three times. You know, it's a tech, so certain cards might care about that, or like Iron Man. It's a weapon, so again, you could potentially use it with Mean Swing and things like that. So this is actually pretty good, or Move Tufts. If you're playing a hero that's really not good, at dealing small amounts of damage, like Captain Marvel likes this card, Iron Man likes this card. People who like tough actually is a huge problem for them because they're always doing big chunks of damage. This is this has got a place in the card pool. Honorary Guardians, you know, same thing as the Avengers, just turns some people into Guardians, so potentially useful in very specific types of decks. Ready to Rumble was super, super good to come out with Spectrum. Anytime you're playing some sort of form changer, Ant-Man or Wasp, Spectrum, Vision, Kitty but also heroes that flip up and down from Alter Ego and back that lets you discard this to ready you up. You know, this basically gives you access to your recovery if you want to use it. This could ready you after you played Meditation. So there's there's a lot of good uses for this card. It's a, it's a really good one. Sidearm, it's kind of nice to have an upgrade in basic for allies. There's upgrades in every aspect now, not for every ally, but they're out there. But it's nice to have something for and every deck. Plan B, just discard a card at random, deal two damage. That one's okay. And the right heroes that end up with cards in their hand or... Like, this is a nice card for Hulk. If he's going to have to discard his last card anyway, you might as well check up for two damage. Uh, I already made a 10-minute video all about how I feel about the symbiote suit, but I think it's really cool with the right heroes. It's risky with the wrong ones. Well, it's risky with all of them, but it's just such a, such a cool card, and I love the theme of it. So, huge fan of that one. Ingenuity, absolutely incredible. I love I love cards like this that go all the way back to the core set and make heroes better. This works with Peter Parker and Tony Stark, as well as Wasp. And then, of course, came with Ironheart, works with her. We can expect to work with Reed Richards in the future, Beast. It's just really neat that all of a sudden we start getting support for the Genius trait, and it's just such a useful card for two. You get a resource every turn. Most of the resource supports cost three in basic, so it's nice to get one at two. You know, it's very limited, and everybody is only in... A genius and alter ego so you're only gonna be able to play it then but certainly for the people who can take it this is pretty much an auto include warrior the great web was sort of there to solve the problem that why isn't spider-man a spider-woman a web warrior now maybe this is an unpopular opinion but i never thought it was that big of a deal that they weren't you know the web warriors in the comics yes spider-woman and spider-man were around when all that stuff started but you know they were around long 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 before that they were avengers long 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 before that so I could see maybe a future version of Spider-Man, Spider-Woman having the Web Warrior trait, but I wasn't too fussed about it. But either way, we have the card now. So if you really want Spider-Man, Spider-Woman to become a Web Warrior, it's there. But that's not all it does. Thankfully, it, they took it a step further. And after Web Warrior out of these play, whoever you put this on gets plus one attack till the end of the phase. That's actually a really powerful effect because there are quite a few good Web Warrior allies. A lot of them give you bonuses for when they enter play or leave play anyway. So you sort of want them bouncing in and out of play. And getting that plus one attack off of that each time is going to really pay for itself. You know, it only costs one to get it out. So this is a really cool card, even if you're not trying to make some older heroes web warriors. 
And similar to the limited stamina, we got Unshakable that can only be played for 14 printed hit point heroes. And you know, the big old picture of Paul gives you clues to who it might be particularly good for. But it is nice giving your hero steady. It seems like all the 14 hit point heroes for the most part are big bruisers that really rely on their attack stat. So getting stunned is very crippling for Hulk and Thor and She-Hulk. Not so much SPDR, but most of the rest of them. So it's, it's certainly nice to have that way to reduce that weakness. And that's, I said I was gonna stop saying it, but I'll say it one more time. What's so nice about being basic, you know, this goes in every single deck regardless of color. And then finally, you know, if you wanna make somebody an X-Men, you can do that. One thing that's cool that we're seeing now that they're doing with the X-Men though, is they're also playing off the mutant trait. We've seen some cards and the Rogue just got announced yesterday. And we saw some cards that had to be mutants to play them. And we've seen a couple others already, but there's quite a few now. And there's no way to become an honorary mutant because, of course, you know, you're born that way. So that's really cool that you might be able to become an X-Man, but you can't become a mutant. I just, I like that theme. And then finally, we go through the basic supports. And these are where it gets really, really useful. A lot of these are really, really, really good if you're a hero that can take them. And that's the big thing. You know, Avengers Mansion, Helicarrier to this day could still go in pretty much every single deck. They're just so unbelievably useful. And then, you know, if you're an Avenger and you're playing a lot of Avenger allies, Avengers Tower is very good. If you're an Avenger, Queen Carrier is great. Team building came along and said, we don't care what trait you have, but play a lot of it. And team building, this is a fantastic, fantastic card for the right heroes or just the right decks. You know, if you're building a theme deck around a team, only costing two compared to three for these other, you know, more general use resource supports, is just phenomenal. Most of the time I'd only take one, but for certain heroes like Spider-Ham, I'll take two or even three. Or if I'm playing like a really heavy Avengers deck or a really heavy Web Warrior deck, I might consider taking a couple of them. They're just, they're all good. If, they, if there is a support for your team, play it because they're just so useful. CITT, two resources to ready a Guardian character. You know, you get that on the table and you just kind of forget about it. And then occasionally is going to do so much work for you. You get another five attack out of Drax is obviously a huge use for this, but just anytime you've got this and maybe you just have cards in your hand you can't do anything with, drop two into this and ready them back up. And if you have the power in all of us, you can actually use that to pay for this because it counts as two resources for a basic card. So that's a nice little combo. Nowhere if you're playing Guardians Allies, you definitely want to have this in your deck. Crew Quarters, to me, completely replaced downtime, even though I already wasn't playing it in the first place, then it heals one damage from an Alter Ego. So downtime gave you a plus two to your recovery, but if you heal once when you flip down and heal one more on the way back up, then that accounts for the two. But it can also heal someone else if they happen to be an alter ego, so that's just, just so much more useful. Uh, that, that gets a lot of play for me if I'm even planning on to alter ego just a few times. The Bifrost, this one, I think is probably the weakest of the team-specific supports, just in that there aren't very many Asgard allies, unfortunately. You exhaust it to search your deck for an Asgard ally and play it. Now, you still have to pay the cost, but there are just a handful of Asgard allies. I think there's only one in basic, and then there's a few in aggression, and one or two in leadership. Like, there's just not, you, there's not you're not gonna get a lot of this, and the fact that it only searches your deck. You know, you can't get them out of the discard pile, which, to be fair, that'd probably be too good, but that just, it's even more limited, so. I mean, you're still probably going to use it if you're playing Thor Valkyrie, but I'm really hoping we see more Asgard support in the future. I'm sure we will, and this card can only get better. Government Liaison is amazing if you're playing the shield stuff. This is basically a helicarrier, or this is basically a team building exercise specifically for shield stuff, but it can team up with a helicarrier to reduce it even for further, and they cost two versus three, which is just nice, so very, very cool, and you can actually use one to help pay for the next one, which is really nice too. Sky Destroyer, if you're playing Shield, is going to give you a couple free damage. This is great. Web of Life and Destiny, I said in the 50th that this was my favorite of these supports. I'm not sure if that's true anymore now that we're looking at the X-Men cards, but this card is still amazing. The fact that it's zero for a Web Warrior, and then every time a Web Warrior leaves play, you get to let somebody draw a card. It doesn't even have to be the person whose ally left. You know, player B's ally could leave, and you could let player D draw a card. Like, that's just really, really versatile. So that card's awesome. Champion Mobile Bunker. I made a video about how much I thought these cards were awesome for the champions. Letting somebody draw two cards and then discard two cards. You don't net any cards, but just getting that card filtering, making your hand better. It's just really, really good. Now we get to the X-Men. And one, two, three. The fact that there are already six 
X-Men supports. You know, we just went through all the other supports in the game and there were like two for the Avengers and two for S.H.I.E.L.D., one for Web Warriors, one for Champions, six for the X-Men already. And we just saw a couple more in the Rogue Pack. And I can't remember if there was one in Gambit or not, but that's crazy how much support the X-Men have. And this brings me to just a really interesting discussion, I think, we talked about a little bit at the beginning, but is basic too good? Like, how much room do you have left in your X-Men deck after you include all these cards? Well, I think they've done a good job in, in still allowing for variety because the X-Jet, yeah, that one's pretty universally useful. It's going to give you a resource. You probably always want this. So, so there's that one. But then, like, the X-Mansion is only usable in Alter Ego, and it's, it's you know, you heal one damage from Mutant or X-Men, so it's very similar to the crew quarters. The nice thing about this is it can be used on allies. But if you're not really concerned about keeping your allies alive, or you're not planning on going to Alter Ego a lot, this one isn't. This one doesn't end up in every deck, I don't think. Now Utopia, this one might be my new favorite support card. This one increases your ally limit by one if you're playing X-Men. And if you've played an X-Men deck, it's really hard not to play a lot of the allies because they already have a lot of different ones and they're really good and you're playing the X-Men, so you want to play them as a team. Even in solo, you still want to have like a team of X-Men. And this one, after an X-Men ally enters play, you exhaust it to ready an X-Men character. That is so unbelievably useful. You know, allies are already awesome. Playing an ally to the table is already like the best thing you can do in this game. And then the fact that it readies another character, whether it's your hero or another powerful ally that you might have built up. This is just, I think this one does go in just about every single X-Men deck. Love that card. The Danger Room is another one that's more specific, so you, this one might not. You know, this one, after an X-Men ally enters play, you exhaust it to put a training upgrade on it. It's awesome. You get to search for your deck and discard pile and put it right on for free. You get so much value out of this card, but not every deck is going to use the Danger Room and training upgrades, so I think there's still some room for variety with this one. Cerebro goes in a lot of them, probably. And again, this is me showing my solo bias. I imagine in multiplayer, you're probably going to see all of these cards among the players because it's a lot easier to get to Alter Ego. And these can all be triggered by somebody else in Alter Ego, regardless of who played the card. So in multiplayer, I think you do see all of these. But in a solo deck, I, I think you have to pick and choose. You shouldn't just run all of them. The ones that are coming out with Rogue, the Moyer McTaggart and the X-Gene, might be seeing those in just about every one, certainly the X-Gene. But this one lets you search the top five cards of your deck for an X-Men ally or your whole deck if you happen to have a Psionic character on the table, which it's possible in every aspect just because we'll look at the Professor X ally, though that would require some very specific timing. But the point is, this is really useful, but you have to be an alter ego, so not quite an auto-include for solo, but yeah, probably in multiplayer, you're going to have that out there. And then the newest one that we've gotten our hands on is Weapon X. Similar to Cerebro, you have to be an Alter Ego to play this one and allows you to exhaust it and take a damage and then discard cards from your deck until you discard an identity specific card, add it to your hand. So basically Kamala Khan's ability, now this does deal a damage to you, which is that big of a deal. But you know, if you're Colossus, this could ping your tough off. So keep that in mind. But if you've got a crew quarters or the X mansion, you could just immediately heal that damage back. So this card is really, really, really cool for the right hero. So when it comes to basic, I think really the cream of the crop comes with the supports. There's just some incredibly useful cards. And similar to what I said earlier, if you're if the card has your team's trait on it, you probably want it in your deck. So, and I think that's what basic's there to do. Now, obviously there are basic allies, but I want to talk about all the allies in the game. So I'm going to save them for the next section. So another thing I wanted to talk about in the deck building series, and I just never got to it, I kept putting it off till the third video, and then I didn't have time for it, is I wanted to talk about the role of allies in deck building. I think everybody knows, and I've certainly mentioned it a few times across these videos, that allies are the most powerful card type in this game. They do so much for you. There is a reason that there is a three ally limit, because if you could play as many allies as you want to, you probably wouldn't play any other card type because they just do so much for you. You know, they have stats like a hero so they can thwart or attack. They all have some kind of useful ability that some can be pretty specific and others can be just so universally helpful. And then you can use them to block, preventing any number of potential damage from the villain. So it's amazing how much allies can do. And similar to the discussion about are basic too strong? Certainly there's an argument to be made that allies are too strong 
But I don't think it's that they're too strong. This is simply just part of the game's design, and they certainly intended for you to use allies. And I think that that's where maybe some of the acrimony comes from. You know, when you play this game and you're playing your hero, you want it to be all about your hero. But again, that's where the choice of deck building comes in. And if you don't want to include a lot of allies, you are certainly free not to, and it works fine. I don't know how many Drax decks I played where I pretty much only ever included maybe one other ally outside of Manus because I wanted it to feel like a one-on-one -on -one knife fight with Drax and the villain, and you can certainly do that. But it definitely is hard not to include at least a handful of them because they are so darn good. Now, I do need a little bit of a break from talking about basic cards, so I'm going to save those for the end. Now, I have these ordered sort of by how generally useful I think they are. So we start with leadership, and we start with pretty much just the best ally in the whole game, certainly the best cheap ally in the whole game anyway, and that's Maria Hill. You know, she really sets a standard for how good allies can be for only two cost. She's going to thwart for two, which there are not very many allies in the game that thwart for two at two cost. And when she enters play, each player draws a card, and solo still useful, and four players crazy. Maria Hill determines the first player in a four-player game. Whoever has her in their deck, they go first because you're hoping that she comes out on the first turn. Everybody gets to draw a card. You can build decks that just spam her over and over and keep filling the table's hands with cards. It's just, it's awesome how useful she is. So it's all downhill from here, unfortunately. But Maria Hill, if you're playing blue, it's hard not to go with her. Now, I'm not going to spend that much time talking about every single one of these, but it's hard not to talk a lot about Maria. She's just so great. And then we just have a lot of other very useful allies. You know, Ant-Man has nice stats, and you can choose how much you pay for him. Clue helps you find event cards, which can actually be your hero-specific event cards, which are just so, so, so useful. You know, Hawkeye helps bring down the minions as they come into play. And the fact that they have these useful abilities, oh, and they can thwart or attack for you, and they can block for you after you've used their activations up, it's, it's incredible how, how awesome allies are. And I think the other thing that makes it so great is just the theme that they bring in. You know, these are the friends of the hero. These are the people, the team that you've put together to take down this job. And I know that there are some players who do not like blocking with their allies because they feel bad that their allies are dying for their heroes. They're not dying. They're simply stunned. They're simply knocked out. They've simply left the battlefield. They'll be back later. Nobody was killed. <laughs> Nobody ever dies in comics. And if they do, they always come back. So... Don't feel bad if you're using these as chump blockers. It certainly seems to be a big part of the game's design. It's the most efficient use of an ally. You know, if they only have one hit point left, that is certainly more valuable than one thwart or one attack to prevent four, five, six damage from a villain attack. So it's really hard not to use it for that. But, but don't feel bad. They're not dead. They'll be back. Uh, Beast is one of the newer ones I think is incredibly useful for a lot of decks. He comes into play. You get to search your deck and discard pile for a resource card. And that could be, you know, a double or it could be a hero-specific resource card, which are super useful and you get a lot of use out of him. Black Panther goes and finds you an event and then attaches it to him so you can get a make the callback or a sneak attack or to me, my X-Men. You know, this might be kind of weird to put him in an X-Men deck, but it might be nice. White Tiger's going to draw you some cards. Squirrel Girl hits everybody. Like, these are all, you know, you really, if you're playing leadership, it's kind of hard to pick which of these useful allies you want to use. You know, it just really depends on your deck. And then there's quite a few heavy hitters. You know, Goliath, Giant Man, Power Man, Havoc, Gentle, Beta Ray Bill. You know, depending on the cost, the team, how you want to pay for these guys, they're all can add a lot of damage to your deck, which is good because leadership doesn't really have good attack events. So you're going to be relying maybe on your allies or your hero to deal your damage. But you certainly have some bruisers to choose from. So just depending on which direction you want to go, you have a lot of good options. And then we get to some that uh, I think require a little bit more effort, vision, is good, but you want to be readying him a lot. Adam Warlock, you kind of want to have an idea of what you're wanting him to do and then sort of build for that. You know, Falcon's a little pricey for what he does. Black Knight, eh. Piercing isn't very prevalent in the game, so that's nice, but eh, he's just okay. And Mirage, you know, can stun some people. She's really good if you're sneaky with a danger room in a leadership training. But outside of that, she might be a little overcosted. I think I was a little bit higher on her in my preview of her than... I haven't played with her yet, but I'm a little... I've cooled on her some, but she seems like she could be good. I've never been a fan of U.S. Agent. The retaliate on allies just isn't exciting to me. Now, I suppose if you're using them to block minions, that could be pretty good. But there's just so many other allies I like more that I just never seem to get around to using U.S. Agent. Probably should have used him when he was new and I had fewer choices, but I just never did. Hawkeye, I just really don't like this ally. 
Same with Wonder Man. It's cool that he attacks for three, but you have to discard a card from your hand. There's just usually something better to do. Now, if you're playing with the leadership card mass attack that adds up all your allies attack and adds it to your hero, then it's nice to be able to get three attack for only two to put them on the table. And then we start to get to the ones that uh, are more team specific or are very build specific. You know, if you're playing an Avenger, Stinger is great just for being a one cost blocker or she can set up really big strength in numbers turns. Captain America, you know, it says he costs six. He really costs one less for each Avenger character you control. So at least your hero is probably an Avenger, so five. But even then, if you get him down to three or four, he's just a two-two with toughness. That's strong. It's not exciting, but I've never really gone out of my way to, you know, try to get him really cheap. But that could be a fun thing to try to do. And in all Avengers build, you know, with like Mighty Avengers, Avengers Assemble, stuff like that, his stats become much more interesting. And we have like Cloud Nine that wants to boost aerial characters. I think in multiplayer, that could be a fun way to play. You'd have a leadership thwarting deck where everybody's aerial and you get a ton of thwart. That could be pretty cool. Captain Marvel wants you to play with a lot of lightning resources. That could be an interesting thing to do. Then we have like our classic Voltron allies that if you're going that way, you're going to include these allies. But if you're not, then you're probably not including these allies. The Guardians got Major Victory, which I actually like him quite a bit. When he leaves play, he gets to ready a Guardian character. And he was one of the main reasons I like playing Drax in leadership. Getting an extra attack out of Drax is fun. But certainly any of them would be useful. Uh, Patriot seems okay. He comes into play, you choose a champion, they get plus one to each of their basic powers at the end of the round. This could be really fun with Nova on an Unleash the Nova Force turn. But outside of that, not too exciting. And same with Falcon. After you attacks with Thwart, you can spend a lightning resource to ready another champion character you control. You know, readying is always nice, but you have to pay four to get him on the table and then another resource to do it. I, I haven't really given this guy much of a go. And then finally, we have Fixie for the X-Men. That This card is ridiculously, ridiculously good. That when you play, you get an X-Men ally from just Carpal to your hand. Just you can get Beast back. If you're playing Cyclops, you can get anybody back. Forge is another really nice one to recycle. She is just so, so good. So unsurprisingly, the allies for leadership are absolutely phenomenal for the most part. You know, there's a few I said I'm not that high on, but there are just quite a few really, really good ones. And, you know, I think we've always thought leadership was the strongest aspect. And the fact that the allies are so good and allies are so good in general is really the reason why. Because the rest of the leadership's cards outside of the staples, like make the call, rapid response, you know, the ones that you see over and over, there are so many leadership events I do not like you know they, they have all these weird ways to do attacks and stuff like that and it's just not interesting but it doesn't matter because they have amazing allies that just get all the work done for you so leadership you kind of love it or hate it and I think this is the reason why now let's take a look at the protection allies which I feel like these guys have always been sort of the least exciting group of allies in the game probably but there are a few that i really really love jocasta being my favorite you know she enters play and you get to choose a defense event in your discard pile and attach to her face down and then later play it as if it were in your hand the fact that it's not limited to a protection event like black panther can get a leadership event and add it to him and you know make the calls like the only good leadership event so <laughs> you know not that exciting i'm kidding but kind of but here you know you can get a hero specific defense event back so that's huge you know you could get a quick shift you could get a parry you could get a wiggle room like there are just so many good hero specific defense events that she can pull out of the discard pile to get one more use out of it's just absolutely incredible she's gonna thwart for you for two in protection which is very very nice to have and then take a hit she's just she's fantastic brother voodoo is another one i really like similar to clue he starts top five cards for an event that's always going to be good He's a little pricier, but again, he's going to thwart for two, which is nice. Iron Fist essentially locks the villain down for three turns. You get two stuns out of him, and then he can block. And he does three damage each time he attacks the first two times. Just so, so good for four. I don't play a lot of four-cost allies, but Iron Fist is worth it. I like Victor quite a bit because he can just stand in front of minions and block them over and over. And since protection isn't particularly good at killing minions, this is just a nice answer to that. As long as it doesn't have guard or annoying ability, you can just keep blocking it with Victor every turn. Uh, this new Daredevil one is potentially interesting. You know, he costs two. And one of the things I certainly want to talk about when it comes to the role of allies in deck building is really any two-cost ally 
is worth taking a look at just because it can block for you. Like paying two for the ally, getting some use out of it, and then blocking is a good use of your resources. Being able to handle that defense for you is totally worth it. So even if their abilities aren't that exciting, which has largely been the case for many of the allies in protection, if they're cheap, then it's worth including them just for that. But so we have this Daredevil that only costs two. He has three health, which is nice. And after he defends against an attack, you move a damage from him to the attacking enemy. So similar to Victor, if you've got him blocking minions, you know, you could actually get a lot of work out of him. And if you put a little effort into keeping him alive, either trying to boost his health or just healing him, in the right situations, I think he could be really, really useful. Starhawks kind of has the fun mini game of taking exactly the right amount of consequential damage and then jumping back into your hands. So he only costs two. He's easy to play again. Now, in that case, you're not really using him for a chump blocker, which is kind of weird. But you get a Thor and an attack out of him, comes back to your hand. You either use him as a resource or play him again. He's pretty cool. Clea, I've always liked. She's cheap. You know, does a thing, blocks, jumps back into your deck, comes right back out. So for a long time, Clea and Starhawk were pretty much the only two two-cost protection allies that we had. But the fact that Starhawk returns to your hand and Clea returns to your deck, it almost didn't matter. You just... You just included them because they were cheap, but you really can get a lot of use out of them. You know, we have uh, Black Widow from the core set. I like her in some decks. You know, if there's a certain encounter card you're just really not wanting to see in a scenario, it could be just Shadows or something particularly annoying in Ronin or something. You know, she's there to remove it, but then you got to reveal another one. I've never thought that that was really worth the effort, but she's there if you need it. I think Nova is an underrated one where when an enemy initiates an attack against you, you spend a lightning resource to deal two damage to that enemy. You know, in a build with, that's already running Retaliate and damage from energy barriers and damage from sidestep and Dauntless and things like that, two more damage from Nova can be a lot of fun. So I think he's actually worth getting on the table and then he just sits back and pings for two every turn. This is a case where one of those enhanced resource upgrades the one that produces lightning might be worth your time because you, at least you're guaranteed to have three uses of him. So that's the type of combos that you could potentially do. I actually really like this card. Multiple Man is a very, very interesting one that you can include. He's not unique. You can include all three of them. When you play one, you go get to fetch the other two. But each time you draw one and don't play it, he becomes a much less interesting proposition because you're only going to fetch one fewer. I, I like the concept, and I've used him in a few decks, but he certainly is uh, makes a rare appearance. Charlie 27, I've never really cared for. Four cost ally just has to be really exciting to me, and retaliate and toughness is not exciting to me. Uh, protector, you can heal her, which is kind of cool, I guess, but eh, just okay. Moon Dragon, outside of that one time, Descry Gaming did something crazy weird with her. I've never thought much of her, but what he did was cool. Go look up his stuff to find out. And Martyr is another one that seems like it could be cool, but after Martyr takes consequential damage from performing an attack, if that attack defeated an enemy, give her a tough status card. So there's some potentially cool interactions there, but again, she costs four, so there's just that's so much effort to get one of these guys out. Luke Cage, another four coster I never really played, even from the core set. I don't know if I've ever used Luke Cage outside of a very early core set decks. Warlock, you can heal him, but you're not getting that much use out of him, so it's not that exciting. And then we get to the team-specific ones, where pretty much I always include Pinpoint if I'm playing a Protection Champion. Just being able to shuffle a card back into your deck as it leaves play. You know, so allies or if upgrades happen to get discarded or whatever, super, super useful. I really like him. Silk is incredible that when you play her, you get to search the deck for a specific treachery and discard it if you're a web warrior. So, so, so good. You know, as a two-coster, you're already going to include her anyway, and then that ability is amazing. Spider-Man Noir has some interesting effects where when a, you resolve a treachery, you can attach it to him, and that boosts his stats. So you kind of want him just sitting on the table collecting treacheries. And it's a response, so, you know, you just wait for the annoying ones and then tuck them under. And, like, if you're playing a four-player game that's going to last a while, this might actually be worth it to collect shadows, to collect under fire, to collect... You know, just whatever the most annoying treacheries are, so you don't have to keep seeing them over and over again over the course of the game. And then if you do collect all three, you know, he's attacking or thwarting for three, but you probably want to keep him alive so the treacheries don't go away. He's kind of a weird, a very weird card, but I do like how out there the effect is, and you can make some use of it. Now, Spider-Man Miles Morales is pretty good, but again, he costs four. But you could potentially stun and confuse an enemy if you control at least three of Warrior cards. So it's after he comes into play, 
So he counts as one, your hero would count as another. So as long as you have one other web warrior card, you know, the web of life and destiny or another ally, it's really not hard to get that ability from him. It's just, you know, four is always a lot for me to pay. Now, Spider UK just became absolutely busted with a new card, Hangar Bay, that when he defends against an attack, you deal damage to the attacking enemy equal to the number of web warrior cards you control. The fact that that's an interrupt means you deal the damage before the enemy does theirs. So if you have enough web warrior cards to kill, say you're blocking a minion, then he just kills it and he doesn't take the damage. And now there's a card, Hangar Bay, I'll put a picture of it on the screen, that if an ally blocks and doesn't die, you get to ready it. So he can block and kill two minions a turn. It's just nuts. Nightcrawler, we'll get to the X-Men ones now. Uh, when an X-Men character would take any amount of damage, you get to spend a lightning resource and return to your hand to prevent it all. So similar to the Mockingbird ally from Hawkeye. You know, if you can get set up with an X-Jet, a Helicarrier, you know, some other resource upgrade where you could pay for him for free, you know, he could be, this could be your defense strategy right here. It would take some setup, so probably better in multiplayer, but... I think you could build almost a whole deck around just him. He is so, so cool, which I'm really, really glad, right? Because it's, it's Nightcrawler. Everybody loves Nightcrawler. Rock Slide, just another one of those big old guys that sits there and blocks for you or to retaliate. It's not that it's not good. It's just kind of boring. And then Polaris is absolutely fantastic. She enters play, give an X-Men character a tough status card. I said it in my preview, but I love the fact that even if you're not playing X-Men with her, you know, she can just give herself the tough. But if you're playing an X-Men, you're probably going to give it to your hero. Either way. Just super, super good. So the protection allies have definitely gotten better. And we saw the Iceman one in the Rogue Pack where he's similar to Hawkeye and that he's going to stun the next three minions that come out. So he's really cool. And uh, let's do Aggression next. And we're just starting with my favorite ally in each aspect. I don't play a lot of Aggression, so you know I don't have a lot of old favorites. But certainly I have a new favorite. And that is Psylocke. Now she plays like Iron Fist as she gets two counters. And when she attacks, she removes a counter to confuse the enemy. Deals the damage to it. Now I know I just got done harping on four cost allies. And that is a lot. But the fact that you get two, two confuses out of her and aggression is incredibly, incredibly nice. If you're playing solo aggression, it is really, really hard to flip to your alter ego side. And so having this as a potential option. Now the fact that she's four cost means you might not be able to play her when you draw her. Which would be sad. But if you can get her on the table, she's going to be incredibly helpful for the heroes that want to play aggression but also need to go to Alter Ego. You think like Wasp, you think like War Machine. They do really well in aggression, but they also really like their Alter Ego side, Colossus. You know, she enables that. So huge, huge on this card. I really like her. And Sunfire is another great new X-Men aggression ally. He only costs two, so automatically awesome. You know, he attacks for two with only one consequential. And after you play him from your hand, you could potentially discard one of those super annoying villain attachments that, you know, require you to spend three resources or whatever. You have to pay an extra to do it, but it's totally, totally worth it. So it's so nice to have a card in the general card pool. Now it is limited to aggression, but it's still nice to have a card in the general card pool that can just blow up those stupid, annoying villain attachments. So I think you take him anyway. This is another nice thing I like about this card. You know, he could have been a three or a four cost ally that had this effect, and then maybe it was just free, like it just happened when you play him. But then you would really only include him in very specific scenarios. The fact that he only costs two means you're going to include him anyway. And then you might get that bonus occasionally if you need it. So I love the design of this card. I think he's very strong. And then everybody's going to love Wolverine. This is an amazing for four costs. He's going to attack for three. He heals. He has piercing. This is a four cost ally worth playing in pretty much any aggression deck. You get him on the table, he's going to do a lot of work for you. You could build around him or he could just be generally useful. The one thing he doesn't really do for you, I think, is take a hit. Like, you probably don't want to be chumping with him unless it's an emergency. And that might be true of a lot of the four-cost allies, but especially with him, you, you really want to get that three attack with piercing. That is nice. And the fact you don't have to block with him, you can just sit there and let him heal. So, yeah, I think he's great. Now, Marvel Boy, Marvel Boy is fine, but, you know, he only costs two, so he's pretty good. And you might make occasional use of his ability to gain piercing range, but mostly he's going to hit for two and then block, and I think that's totally fine. Throg is really good. When he enters play, you give him a tough status if you're engaged with a minion, and a lot of aggression strategies want to summon minions or have minions engaged with you anyway. So that is often going to be useful, and even if it's not, you know what? Attack for two and take a hit. What's worth it to me? Bug, another great one. The nice thing about Bug is you actually might consider thwarting with him. You know, a lot of these other ones have two attack, 
or you're encouraged to attack with them. Like she can thwart for two, which is super nice for aggression, but you really want to attack with her to get the confuse. You know, Bug, he only attacks for one anyway, so you probably can thwart with him, which you're going to want in aggression. And then when your hero attacks, you get to heal him. So he's just really nice. Try to keep him around. Now, if you put, end up putting an energy spear on him, you're going to want to attack with him. But if you're not going to that point, I think you just thwart with him, and that's really nice. Spider Girl, her ability is going to be useful occasionally, but you know she was one of the original two-cost aggression allies, so certainly has seen a lot of play just for that reason alone. Hulk, in my mind, is really just a blocker. You know, you pay two, and with five hit points, there's a good chance he'll take at least two hits for you. And that can be really, really nice. Attacking with him is its a risk because you might deal some extra damage and you can build a whole deck around this. One of the decks I suggested in the second part of the series for aggression was just building a deck all around punch resources and using Hulk to get that extra two every time attacking for five. That's amazing. But, you know, dealing one damage to each character, he might kill some of your other allies or other players. Or more often than not, it seems like you end up flipping either the mental or the wild and then he's just gone. So I, I like Hulk a lot, but I really just block with him, which I know is probably anathema to some people, but that's how it goes. And then now I have a confession to make when we come to this card here. I don't know if Braun just got lost in my box at one point or just got tucked in the very, very back. And I don't play a lot of aggression anyway, but I kind of forgot this card existed. So when I was going through these, getting ready for this, and I read what he did... I felt like I had discovered something that everybody else has known all along and somehow I've just been completely unaware of. He seems really good. Am I am I crazy? He attacks for one and he removes a threat from a scheme. And he has five health. This is the thing that makes him so good. If there was a support or an upgrade that cost three that just dealt a damage or removed a threat every turn, I think I'd play that card. And you know, for five turns, he's going to do that for you. That's pretty much going to be most of the game by the time you get him out. Yeah, this card just seems amazingly good for aggression. Removing a threat and dealing one damage every turn. Really, it's a threat removal I'm excited about. But yeah, I, I just kind of didn't even ever, ever give this card a second thought. I've never looked at it twice. I've never played with it. And now I'm kind of excited to. Maybe I'm overstating it, but I know he's been out for a long time. Somehow I completely missed out on Braun. I'm excited to use him. He seems really, really strong to me. I like Wasp quite a bit. You know, you can make her cheap and then she can either take a hit for you or you pay a lot of lightnings get a lot of three attacks which is pretty cool valkyrie's pretty nice for minion control now aggression's already good at minion control but the fact that you get three damage for free if you paid for the lightning along with her attacks and block it's pretty pretty solid actually angela is one of my absolute favorite aggression allies you know you get zero cost she's going to attack a couple times and block at the low low cost of getting a minion out of the deck Occasionally, this is really going to hurt you if you can only find Mr. Hyde or <laughs> Rhino or something. But most of the time, you'll be able to find something you can reasonably handle. You probably have some other effects that benefit from minions anyway. So she she enables a lot of fun things, and she's just very generally useful. Even if I'm not playing a minion summoning strategy, I still think she's worth using. Hercules kind of goes along with that. If you're using her to summon minions, then they can make Hercules cheaper. But kind of similar to Captain America, his cost already starts so high that if you reduce it, you know, some, then you end up with a decent ally. Like, it's not that great. Cool that it has the Olympus trait, though. We haven't seen that anywhere else. And here's another card I sort of forgot existed. I'm not as excited about it as I was about Braun, but kinda. For four costs, you get two thwart or three attack and five health. Like, that's so crazy. And yeah, you get an encounter card, and that's not great, but and we get extra encounter cards all the time. What's one more? And he's probably going to help you deal with whatever that problem was with his thwart and his attack and the fact that you're going to get to use him so many times. So this is another one that I feel like I've sort of missed out on now. Four costs is, again, a little less exciting. You're putting a lot into this guy, but man, I, I think he might be... I think that extra encounter card isn't as scary as you probably think at first glance. Tigra, Corset Classic. If you're playing a lot of minions, she's definitely an option worth including. You can get the Thor ally here. He comes in with toughness, which is a little weird for his tempo because you're going to want to attack immediately, but this means you get one more attack out of him. It's going to eat that two consequential. And the fact that he can wipe out a whole whack of minions sitting in front of somebody is incredibly powerful. So you're probably better in multiplayer or in very specific builds, but this Thor seems really strong. I've never played him because I don't play a lot of aggression or multiplayer, but it seems good to me. Now we see one of the newer ones here, Dust. Similar to Thor, you know, she could just take out a ton of minions if you put some effort into her so she seems pretty cool 
Magic, I really, really like a lot. After you play it from your hands, you're paying three, and if you pay one more, so kind of a four-cost ally, I've said it enough, but you can just make a minion go away, you know, a non-elite minion, but there's still a lot of nasty non-elite minions, and you shuffle back into the deck, that's pretty much as good as killing it. So, really, really good. And then, you know, she can attack for two, only one consequential a couple times. She seems strong to me. I haven't played her yet, but she seems good. She-Hulk, less so. You know, you bring her out, you paid four for her, and then you thwart for two, so then she gets a couple damage on her, so then she's attacking for three. Then she's got three consequential, and then she either takes a hit or attacks for three. I don't know. She's okay, but I'm not going to say it again. Uh, she calls four. Jane Foster Thor has never been exciting to me just because, you know, she comes out and she does a little bit of extra damage to the villain. I mean, not, not that's, that's not nothing, but certainly early in the game, putting a little damage on the villain isn't going to be helpful. I'd rather have a card that helps me manage the board in some ways. That's why I like Valkyrie better. It might help me take out a minion. But if I was playing, like, multiplayer aggression, going all in on damage, then this is a nice way to push some more damage onto the villain. And then we get a couple trait locked to the champion's allies to round it out. Bombshell isn't that exciting that you have to divide her damage up so you could split up three damage uh, good against small minions i guess but the locust this is probably this is another one of my absolute favorite aggression allies apparently i ordered the aggression allies weird i guess but the locust this is another one of my absolute favorite allies i can only play it with the champions unfortunately but when she comes into play and then she pulls an aggression event from your discard pot of your hand obviously that is just so good and she only costs two so there's a good chance you can still afford to play that aggression event and then she blocks for you. Oh, it's just such a good card. So I have to say, looking through these allies actually got me kind of excited to play some kind of aggression deck, mostly just because I want to try out Brawn and kind of Sentry. But I might have to do it as a champion just so I can also play with the Locust. Next up is Justice. And this is a really small pile, actually. There wasn't a lot of aggression ones either, but this one might even be smaller. Starting off with what might be my new favorite ally for Justice, Blindfold. is so, so awesome. For three, she's going to come out and thwart for you for two. And then you get to look at the top five cards in the encounter deck. Discard one. Now, you don't have to put them back in the same order, so you don't get to make it like the best case scenario, but it's still so nice. Now, the fact that you get to look at five of them, that's a pretty significant chunk. And then you're probably going to find something super annoying that you can just get rid of. And even though you can't reorder the rest of them, at least you know what's coming and you can plan around it. You know, you can set up your blocks better. If you know it's a low boost, you don't bother to waste a defense on it, things like that. I like scrying anyway, and the fact that it comes with two thwart and a block is even better. And there are more and more cards that care about knowing what the top of the encounter deck is. So, you know, she's a nice combo with some other cards, like the new Longshot Ally we'll look at in a little bit. So just, you get so much use out of Blindfold, and I'm so thankful that the X-Men allies are not trait locked to the X-Men. They're just so useful, and they're just these are just generally good cards for the aspect. Monica is another amazing ally. For three, you get to go find a surveillance team, put it into play, and put an extra counter on it. So you get so much use out of her. And if you have other surveillance teams in play already, they all get an extra counter. She is such an auto-include for me. I put her and a surveillance team in almost every Justice deck I build now. It's just so, so nice being able to fetch that card and getting a lot of use out of her. Eros is just generally useful. He costs two. There's not a lot of those. You thwart. He takes a hit. Maybe you confuse some minions that may or may not end up being useful, but, you know, everything else he does is nice. Quake's another one that you're really probably using her just to come out and attack and then take a block, but in some decks where you're going to be an Ultra Eagle a lot, she is kind of nice to just keep on the table and take out those minions that keep scheming. Because I play a lot of decks that like to be an Ultra Ego, and one thing I have found that can be super annoying is it's relatively easy to confuse the villain but then you flip down, you've still got a couple minions in front of you that are scheming, and that sort of makes up for the fact that you confuse the villain. So it's nice having something like Quake to help deal with those minions as well, so they're not sitting there scheming on you. So I really like this card. Wiccan would be nice if he actually worked once in a while. Okay, I'm kidding. But seriously, how often have you flipped over a zero boost when you've thwarted with Wiccan? But occasionally, when it works, you know, three, and we're seeing more and more four boost cards these days... You know, you could get lucky, and he could be really, really strong. But either way, he costs two, so it doesn't matter what he does. Marvel Girl is a newer one that's just really fun for the theme. When she attacks a minion, she basically makes that minion thwart for you, which is just really cool. Or you can just have her thwart for two. So even if there's no minions on the table, you still get some threat removal out of her. Agent Coulson I absolutely love to go fetch 
a spy craft or a target acquired, similar to Monica Chang, just having a card that comes into play and goes and fetches something else is just very useful. And you get some pretty good thwarting out of him as well. really like this card. Jessica Jones is one that in certain situations, probably more multiplayer or you know, she's amazing against the Wrecking Crew. Uh, you know, if there's a lot of side schemes in play, but not too exciting. Otherwise, Jack Flag is really interesting. You could almost build around this guy where after he thwarts, he gets an ammo counter, and then you can exhaust to deal two damage with that counter. So you sort of like go back and forth where you thwart and then attack, thwart and attack. So you can get a lot of use out of this guy, but it might require a little bit of effort. I mean, what are you going to say? It's Daredevil. Clearly, he's the best character in the entire game. But he is actually a pretty good ally, too. I wish he had one more health. But you get a pretty decent amount of use out of him. He thwarts for two, then deals with damage. He's similar to the newly released Brawn ally that nobody knew about until I just told everybody about. In that he kind of does a little bit of both. And so I, I do like Daredevil, but I don't play him a lot just because he costs four. Speed, eh, he can thwart a decent amount quickly, but... Justice is already so good at thwarting. Not quite sure where he lands. I've not one I've really cared to use very much. This guy is pretty awesome in multiplayer. The five cost Spider Man. He comes in, he blows up a side scheme, three threat per player from a side scheme. And then you get a pretty decent amount of use out of him. He's got four health. Now, five's a lot. So that's another reason why you only play him in multiplayer. It's awfully hard to have the tempo to play a five cost ally in solo. You better get a lot of use out of that card. So I don't play him a lot, but I definitely think he's cool. And Spider-Man, you know, deserves to cost so much. That's probably why Captain America is so expensive too, right? Like the biggest character should be big heavy hitter ally, so it works out. And we have Banshee, another expensive ally. When he thwarts, he confuses a minion. That's pretty nice in the right decks. I just got done saying how annoying it can be to have a bunch of minions in front of you scheming, even though you've confused the villain. So he can help contend with that. So maybe in very specific builds, he might be worth playing. Quasar is really nice. It's like a one way or another deck. There's going to be multiple side schemes on the table and he comes and he removes a threat from the main scheme and any side schemes in play. I really, really like Quasar. I play him a lot. Venom is really cool just in that he sets up sort of a mini archetype all on his own along with Pivotal Moment where they want there to be no threat on the main scheme. I wish there were a few more cards that played off that trigger. But, you know, you see how he has two consequential, but if you have no threat on the main scheme, there are only one and then he's attacking for three, which is really good. You know, and you can do it a few times. So Venom's pretty strong, you know, in the right situations. Now Wraith is a really, really interesting ally in that he plays a very specific role and that he can attack for three, but you probably just want him to sit there and cancel boost effects and he takes a damage. That is a very, very useful ability. This really feels more like it should be in protection. They seem to be a little bit more about canceling and counter card effects, but... He is really, really cool in the right scenario. So getting him out early and then stopping some really annoying things from happening, you get a lot of value out of him. I'm actually kind of surprised he's not trait locked to the Guardians just because he's so specific, but he's a cool card. I like this Wasp ally that she's cheap and she can thwart for two and then take a hit, but she's kind of got a lot going on for what little she's going to do. You know, she's trait locked to the champions and then, you know, she can ignore all the annoying things in play. So if I was playing a champion Injustice, I probably would include her, but I wouldn't be over the moon about it. And similar to that, this Spider-Woman ally, reduce the cost to play Spider-Woman by one for each confused enemy in play. Now we've looked at a few other allies like Banshee and Eros that could potentially confuse a bunch of minions. It wouldn't be too hard to get her out for two or one or zero. But again, what are you getting out of her? You're going to attack for two and then she's going to block. So, I mean, that's that's not bad if it only costs one or zero, but, you know, it's a, kind of a lot of effort to make it happen. I don't know, it's just kind of a weird one. Some of these allies feel like you put a lot of effort into them to get, you know, just a couple things back. But, again, I want to reiterate something I said earlier. Sometimes it's okay to just do things for fun. You know, it might be just fun to see if you can get Spider-Woman out for zero. So, there's always that. Always have to remember that. Lady Spider for the Web Warriors... You know, she could potentially remove two thwart from two different schemes. Or if you're able to increase her thwart somehow, which I don't know if there's even a way to do it. But if you could, then she would remove more. So, eh, just okay. And then finally, we get uh, Spider-Man that I'm going to try to pronounce his name. 
but he, he's similar to Quasar and he's going to remove threat from multiple schemes and that could be really, really good. He's going to do at least two probably because he's a web warrior and then you're probably playing a web warrior. So now where Quasar removes one from every scheme in play, you know, he's somewhat limited, but web warriors are strong in other ways. So it's okay that he's less powerful than Quasar, I think. So that is all the Justice Allies, probably my least favorite crop of all the aspects, though I sure do love a couple of them like Blindfold and Monica Chang quite a bit. And finally, we come to the basic allies. And this is probably one of the places where people say basic is just too strong because so many of these allies can go in every deck and are just so, so good. And they're largely better than the aspect allies. And that's one thing about basic. I think I forgot to mention, or at least I didn't say a lot about it, is the cards should generally be less efficient than the aspect cards because they can go in every deck. So that's sort of the cost, the extra cost you're paying is, yeah, the card's not quite as good, but it's always available. But that doesn't really seem to be the case with most of the allies. As we look at these, obviously Nick Fury is just unbelievably, everything I've said about four cost allies, none of that applies to Nick Fury. He is so worth it because you're gonna get three of those cards back. Yeah, you could do damage and towards the end of the game, that might be what you do. You're probably never going to remove the two threat. You're mostly going to be drawing those three cards. So he costs four, then you get three of them back. So if you pay for them with a double, or even better, two, then you know you're netting at least as many cards as you spent. So if you discard cards you didn't care about to get him and three more cards, then you're getting a thwart and an attack and a block. Just unbelievable. Unbelievable value from Nick Fury. Mockingbird isn't too far off. The fact that she comes into play, she can stun the villain for you thwart her attack a couple times and then also take a hit so basically she stops the villain twice for you so good Ironheart probably the most overused but for a good reason card in the whole game there's nothing not to love about Ironheart she only costs two she draws a card thwarts attacks takes a hit like this is is this the most efficient card in the game I don't I don't know the math super well but it's got to be right it's so 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 good you kind of have to just decide not to put Ironheart in your deck just because, because there's no reason not to throw her in there unless obviously you're already playing Ironheart. Spider-Man Miles Morales is just another amazing ally. Like these, just these four could go in like every single deck and they're gonna be better than probably most of the aspect allies you could choose. He comes in, he does a big burst of thwart or attack for you. It's just amazing. Lockjaw is a really, really cool card that you can play from your discard pile. So he could actually go in just about any deck too because sometimes you just have turns where you have nothing else to do or you just desperately need a blocker or something. He's always going to be available to you as long as you've you know, already passed by him. So good. Blade, I love just for being a one-cost Avenger. You know, I like to play him a lot with Earth's Mightiest Heroes just to get those readies. He's really cheap. I don't even bother with this ability that you can, yeah, you can attack for two, without consequential by discarding a card, but I usually just play them in block or combo them with other things that care about having Avengers or allies on the table. War Machine I've never particularly cared for, four cost of toughness, kind of boring. Heimdall I like in the right decks, he's obviously incredibly expensive, but the scrying is nice. Uh, okay, I've, I've used him in like one deck, but he's cool, I like the character. Vivian is amazing, she comes out and blanks some annoying card in play. There are so many cool moments that can happen with her. She can come out and blank an Acolyte, and then you can kill it so it doesn't do its annoying when defeated effect, or like a whatever those, those Hydra guards are that when they leave play, they deal you an encounter card, you blank it first and then kill it, and you don't have to worry about it. stuff like that. I don't know if she goes in every deck, but she really probably could. She's just so useful. Machine Man gives you something to do with any leftover resources. So he's got potential and just, you know, you have access to all the two cost blockers you want. You can get Ironheart, you can get Blade, it only costs one, Vivian, Machine Man. Like your whole defense strategy could just be these cheap, useful gray allies, which again, is that a good thing? I, I'm not here to say whether it is or not, but it's an interesting conversation. Snow Guard's a fascinating ally where depending on where you get to choose what she does, she comes in, she either has three attack and overkill or three thwart and aerial or five hit points and retaliate. So a lot of versatility. But considering you probably know what you're going to do with her, the versatility is more in the deck building with her, like if you need a big hitter or a big thwarter. But you probably know what you're going to do with her when you put her in your deck. Really, really cool. Star-Lord, this is a two-cost alley that is not worth the cost. I think the only one in the whole game because he comes in 
and you deal yourself a face down encounter card. Now, I said Sentry, it's probably worth it, but come on, he had five hit points, two thwart, three attack. This, I don't think an extra encounter card is worth a couple thwarts and a block or whatever. Like, that's, it feel, it always felt like his stats should have been higher or he had a little bit more hit points. Something about him should have been better. A little bit disappointing that the Star-Lord ally never sees much play at all. Cosmo's great for combo builds, like either build him up because he doesn't take consequential damage or use him with like Doctor Strange to help him out, stuff like that. Just a very useful, like this is sort of the quintessential basic card in some ways, like very, very useful in the right situations. And it's nice that you can always have him no matter what aspect you're playing. Gamora is fantastic for the Guardian. She'll fish you out an event. Drax is probably the least exciting, I think, of the Guardian specific allies. He can't attack minions, so he's just going to hit the villain a few times for you. Thematically, it's great, but for me, who doesn't much care about effects that only damage the villain, you know, I'm always looking for ways to manage the board first and then kill the villain later. I've never really cared for the Drax ally, which is fine because I'm usually playing the Drax hero, or at least I used to be. Rocket's really good for managing minions. Like, he's sort of the opposite of Drax, and I find him to be far more useful. Martin X is okay if you're looking for... He only costs two if you're playing Guardian, so he's a two cost with four health. There's probably other better options, but if you're looking for a cheap Guardian, maybe just for the theme, he is an option. Now, Gru is another one of those that pairs so remarkably well with that new Hangar Bay card. After he defends against an attack, you get to heal the damage from him, so he can just keep blocking for you. And then if you have the hangar bay, you could ready him up and he could block again. Like, he's he is so good. He makes it into just about every Guardian deck I build. Just the usefulness is off the charts. Venom, similar to the Symbiote suit, you have to decide if it's worth it. You know, for four cost, you get a lot of use out of him. But you're also getting an extra encounter card. Now he has an ability that you can deal damage back to the villain whenever you reveal an encounter card based on the boost icon. So... It is probably worth it, but you gotta be gotta be careful getting those extra encounter cards. And it's just it's so cool. Like that's one of the more unique cards in the whole game, so it's worth it just for that. Love the art. Moon Girl, I already said in the 50th that this is just about my favorite card in the whole game, and that has not changed. Being able to basically Nick Furrier for a little bit cheaper, and I like the extra effort it actually takes to make her work. I think it's fun to sort of build around that. So love, love, love Moon Girl. Spider Ham's not that great. I really wish he cost a little bit less considering he might knock himself out on his first attack. His consequential damage is based on boost icons, so you don't know what he's going to do. So it fits the theme of the character, but it's not one I'm likely to include, especially when there's better web warriors. Kane, kind of similar to that Venom ally we just looked at, cares about encounter cards, and you kind of mess with them, you might get to draw some extra cards. I think you really have to combo around him because just getting the card back every time doesn't really make up for the cost. But there are other things you can do to get more use out of it. Absolutely love the SPDR ally. Love these allies that jump back into your hand, similar to Starhawk. But the nice thing about her is if you have Web of Life and Destiny on the table, you get to draw a card every time you do it. So if you can time it right where you attack first and then next turn you thwart, defeats her with excess consequential damage, jumps back to your hand, draw a card, play her again. So good. Peter Parker, Spider-Man. Obviously, it's hard to play with requirements, though you can get around it with things like Make the Call. Just, you have... Activate with him, and then you get to ready another Web Warrior character. So, so useful. Hobie Brown might do a lot of damage when he leaves play, or he might do a Wiccan and do basically nothing. Ghost Spider is probably my favorite Web Warrior, if not Peter Parker, Spider-Man. If not SPDR, there's a lot of good ones. But she leaves play, searching for an identity-specific event is so, so, so good. Anytime you get access to your hero cards is fantastic. I also love Otto. Man, it's hard to pick a favorite Web Warrior. They're all so good. He only costs two, which is nice, and he can ready an upgrade. He might draw a card, just so universally useful. Agent 13 is incredible. After she attacks her thwarts, you get to ready a shield support, so it could be your Sky Destroyer, it could be your Helicarrier. You know, it could be your Alpha Flight Station if you're playing Captain Marvel. Super, super good. Dum Dum Dugan looks way more expensive than he really is because you're going to be reducing his cost with things like government liaisons and Helicarriers. And then all the excess consequential looks bad, but it's not because you're going to be reducing it with field agents and you're going to do so much work with Dum Dum. I absolutely love this card. Now, Storm is an interesting one in that she's incredibly expensive, but she's one less if you're a mutant or X-Men, so you're really only going to be paying four for her. And then she can do some crazy things with Thwart where she moves it and then she removes it. 
So you could potentially just like move some threat to a size scheme you don't care about. This is this has got some interesting implications. I haven't messed with her yet, but I'm excited to. Colossus. Now this is one of those I've said all the other ones that just had toughness was really boring to me. The fact that he only has three with toughness is pretty nice. You know, if you're playing an X Men, he's only three. So I think Colossus is actually pretty good. And nothing else, he enables fastball special. So he's good enough just for that. We just recently got the long shot ally that might combo quite nicely with blindfold that when he attacks an non-elite minion if you discard the top card of the encounter deck and has a star icon you just get to knock that minion out so he's gonna either do do damage do it or just straight out kill it so in the right decks really cool otherwise you know probably not worth four and apparently we have two copies of colossus uh, Angel I actually really like. He only costs two if you're an X-Men, and, you know, he attacks for two a couple times, takes a hit. That's actually really, really straightforward and not that exciting, but very useful. And, you know, until recently, the X-Men were really hurting for two-cost allies. Now we have Forge, and there's a couple more, but... Hi, buddy! But it, it's nice to have a few cheap ones, especially in Basic. And then, of course, we have Professor X comes out and confuses the villain, something I've been looking forward to for a very long time. Can go in every single deck. Thwarts for three, this is just the most, one of those universally useful basic cards we're going to see a lot, a lot of play of. Huge, huge, huge fan of this card. And the final ally is Forge. Another one, the X-Men are just so stacked with ridiculously, ridiculously good cards. Two cost comes in, searches for a support, adds it to your hand, and then he takes a hit for you. It's just unbelievably good. So... After all that talk about how many awesome allies there are, I can kind of see why people think maybe they're a little too good. But like I said at the beginning of this, you know, they're just part of the game's design. They're there to be used or not. It's up to you. But when it comes to building your decks, I think the role of allies is just super, super important. But you do have to balance it. You can only have three in play at a time apart from doing things to increase that. So you have to kind of decide how many to put in your deck and which ones you want to use. And obviously we are spoiled for options at this point. And with that, we have finally looked at all of the cards in the game. Okay, so from here, I'm just going to include the original deck building demos that I did. Uh, if they seem a little strangely edited at times, it's just because I was trying to remove some of the things I had already said in the previous video. But there are four different ones than what I built in the original video. So I hope you enjoy those. Now, for the most part in Marvel Champions, when you build a hero, you should be able to build them in any aspect and hope to reliably win with that aspect. With the core set, that isn't always necessarily true. I think it might be difficult to win reliably with a, say, Spider-Man protection solo core set deck. It's, it's You're just going to have a really, really hard time managing the threat. So I probably wouldn't go in that direction, but it would probably work pretty well in the other three aspects. That's one thing that expanding your card pool does do for you, is it definitely makes all four aspects more viable. For any hero in solo play, you could probably come up with something with a large enough card pool, probably come up with something that you could reliably win with any hero in any aspect, at least against you know most villains. But... When we're talking about the core set, we do have to be a little bit more realistic and understand that this is the type of game that expects you to buy more cards, so you might not always be able to win every game in every aspect. Next up, let's try building an Iron Man leadership deck for solo play with just core set cards. You know, when we look at Iron Man, he has a completely different set of challenges that we need to build for as compared to Spider-Man where he doesn't have any trouble dealing medium-sized damage. Repulsor Blasts are great for taking out minions. As is Supersonic Punch, these are nicely costed, and they're incredibly versatile. They can do potentially a lot of damage later in the game to take out the villain. So damage isn't a problem. He's got a little bit of resources with Pepper Pots, even though she's kind of pricey. Stark Tower gets him some card draw. And then when we look at the armor pieces, these kind of do all the work for us. You can use the Arc Reactor to ready him, which is going to give him access to his two thwart, which is nice. The armor gives him plenty of health, which helps him stay alive. Helmet provides some threat removal, though it's only one, but that goes along with his two thwarts, so that's fine. Powered Gauntlets does more nice medium-small damage. And the boots uh, just sort of combo with other things and give him a little bit more health. So he's got a little bit more of everything as compared to Spider-Man, who's really more focused on staying alive. But the trouble with Iron Man is his hand size. It's a completely different challenge where you need to be getting his tech out in order to build up his hand. So what that means is you're going to be needing to stay in Alter Ego 
at least the first turn or two because you're going to want access to that six hand size. You know, if you flip up the hero form in the first turn, you've only played one upgrade, then you're only drawing two cards. That's not going to help you progress very far. So you're going to need to stay in Alter Ego at least on the first turn, if not the first two. So that provides a completely different type of challenge to build for. And again, that's where not every aspect necessarily lends itself to success with just playing with corset cards and trying to win in solo play. But leadership should certainly help us with that. So if we look at what leadership offers us, you know, of course it's gonna be all about allies, but the main thing we're gonna to need to be thinking about since we're saying an alter ego so much is we have to be able to manage threat without flipping to hero form, and that's where allies really help, and that's where Maria Hill is such a huge, huge help. So we're definitely going to grab her, along with the three copies of Make the Call, because we want to be playing Maria Hill as often as possible. You know, she provides that 2-4, and of course the card draw is nice too. But she is going to help us keep from losing the game while we're staying in Alter Ego, and she's going to help us draw cards to get to those upgrades. So we're definitely going to want those. And speaking of that, this is where Emergency actually becomes a pretty attractive option with Tony, because he's going to be an alter ego, which means the villain is going to be scheming. Which means Emergency preventing one threat is actually pretty nice. Now, one threat's not much, but for zero cost, one threat that the math actually checks out there. Basically, you want to be removing one threat per every card that you spend, and anything beyond that is just really, really nice. But So that's actually a pretty good option. And of course, we're going to take our doubles. Tenacity, I didn't really talk about this with Spider-Man. I just, I don't love this card. You know, it costs two to put it out, and then you have to spend another one to activate it. It's not terrible, but unless you're just really, really, really wanting to be using your basic activation a lot, like this is a card I would really consider for She-Hulk, since she can attack for three, and you, she just wants to be punching and punching and punching, then this is a card I might include with her, but I'm not that fussed about putting it in with Tony, because, you know, his basic activation... It's going to be thwarting, it's going to be nice, but we don't need to be spending that many resources to thwart. Since he's going to be an alter ego so much, plus he gets so much extra health with his upgrades, I'm not as excited about first aid yet. We're going to grab Nick Fury and Mockingbird because I just think they're really good. We're going to grab the Mansion and Helicarriage because I think they're really good. And then he's really, really good at medium damage, so I'm definitely less interested in the Haymakers for now. We're going to set those aside. So there's 14 of our 25 cards. And all we've really done is add Basics and Maria Hill. But Maria Hill is kind of the core of our strategy here. We really just want to manage the threat as well as we can. Now, like I said, when you're building with Corset, you're pretty much going to take all the allies you can get because there just aren't very many. So we'll add Hawkeye and Vision just because we want the extra versatility provided by the allies. They are a little pricey, but they're very useful. I'm going to grab two of these lead from the fronts. They give everybody plus one thwart and plus one attack. This is sort of a situationally useful card. You want to have a nice board of allies to really get the most of it. So that's more of a mid to late game card. So we don't necessarily need three of them in our deck. That's just one more thing to think about when you're building. How many copies of each card should you put in? If it's something you really feel like you want to be seeing often and early, you want to include three. But for a card like this that I'm okay if I don't play this until later in the game, I don't need three of them in my deck. I don't need to be drawing these in my opening hand. So we'll start with two of them for now. Again, options are limited in the core set, so we might need the third one just to get to 25. But we'll go with that for now. Kind of the same philosophy with Inspired here. We're not necessarily trying to build any kind of Voltron deck or anything, but still getting the plus one Thwart and plus one Attack, as long as you get at least a couple uses out of this before the ally goes away. You know, if we can put this on Hawkeye or Vision, this is still going to be worth its cost so we're going to grab those all right it's starting to get harder for me to pick cards i really want and this is just another element of deck building a lot of times you're going to know the first batch of cards you're going to want you know whatever inspired you to build the deck in the first place which again with core set cards you're pretty much just trying to shore up your hero's weaknesses there isn't necessarily any major inspiration or huge combos here but still there are going to be some cards that are going to be pretty obvious and then maybe when you get towards the end you know, it might be harder to find exactly what you're looking for, but I'm going to go ahead and grab these two first aids. Uh, one, because they have the mental trait, which is actually useful for Tony. It helps power the boots to get him to aerial, and he wants to be able to get to aerial. So even if you don't need to play the first aid for the healing, it's nice to have some cards in the deck with the mental resource. Definitely something to think about for certain heroes. And also, since we are going to be relying on our allies to do a lot of the heavy lifting in the early game as we're building up our armor, 
you know, healing vision for two or even healing Maria to get one more thwart out of her, you know, paying one cost to get two more thwart isn't that bad. So first aid is actually a pretty decent option here for us. Now we want to be considering, do we want the power of leadership? Let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five. We have five cards that cost two or more in leadership. So we don't really need that much. I'm going to go ahead and include one just because we are looking for cards to fill us up to 40. Now that I think about it, we do also have make the call. And the power of leadership does work through make the call. So in a way, it's like we have three more cards that could potentially cost two. You know, it's going to help us to keep putting out Vision. It's going to help us to keep putting out Hawkeye. You know what? I am going to grab both of them. And worst comes to worst, it's a wild resource. So again, it can be used to help pay for going into Ariel. So it's not all that bad. That puts us to 24. We need one more card. I'm going to go ahead and put that third copy of Inspired in there. Because of Make the Call, we actually have more allies than it looks like we do. So there's a pretty good chance you're going to get enough use out of that that it's going to be worth your while. So if I were building a leadership deck out of the core set with Tony, that is what it would look like, and that's sort of my thought process behind it. Now, let's go ahead and do one more core set deck. I'm actually having a lot of fun putting these together. I didn't plan these ahead of time, so this is just me showing you exactly what my thought process would be like if I were building a deck. Let's build She-Hulk in Justice. So once again, I would go through my hero and see where it struggles and where it's strong. So we know She-Hulk is super good at dealing damage. She has an ability when she flips in a hero form that deals two damage, she can attack for three. She has three copies of this one-two punch. So these basically translate into three more damage each time. She has the Two copies of the superhuman strength, which is two more attack when she does her basic attack and deals some stun, so that helps keep us alive. She's got a split personality, just going to let her draw a bunch of cards once. She's got focus rage, it gives her more card draw. And kind of one of her themes is she sort of wants to take damage so that she can get off a big gamma slam. Now, you don't really need help dealing damage to yourself, the villain's going to do that for you, but you know, with your copies of focused rage, that's going to let you draw some cards. And then, you know, if you can get off a big Gamma Slam, that can pretty much kill off a villain in one hit. So you're going to be able to take out one stage with one Gamma Slam. Where she really struggles, again, is in thwarting. This is actually kind of a common theme with playing in solo, is managing the threat can be really difficult for certain heroes. You know, she's only got a one thwart. She wants to be attacking anyway. And then her thwart cards are kind of weak. You know, she's got two copies of Legal Practice. You have to be an Alter Ego to play it. And then you have to discard cards to remove one threat for each one. It's just, it's very, very inefficient. She's got a couple of those. And then you do have the Superhuman Law Division, which isn't too bad. If you happen to be an Alter Ego, you spend the Mental to remove two threat. That's actually pretty good. But you don't want to be hanging out in Alter Ego or removing threat, even though I know that's also her Alter Ego power prevents the threat. So she's got enough to keep her alive if she does want to flip down, but it's not really going to do a lot for you. So we're Justice makes a good match for her. You know, you just need to be able to manage the threat long enough to win. Like I said at the beginning, you don't have to remove all the threat to win the game. You just need to prevent yourself from losing by the scheme. So just enough threat removal to keep her in the game should be plenty. So really, that's the main thing she's lacking. Now, she doesn't have a lot that's going to keep her alive other than she has a ton of hit points. She's got 15 hit points, but she also wants to be taking damage to, pre to prepare for that Gamma Slam. So she probably wants a little bit of help staying alive. And she definitely wants some help in threat removal. So that's what makes Justice a good match. So let's see what we can do for her. Now, obviously, in the core set for Justice is just such an awesome, awesome option for a moving threat. Or moves three threat for basically three cards. You know, the two at cost plus one more. So basically for three effective resources, you get to remove three threat. And if you do ha manage to hit that mental kicker, you get a fourth. This is just such a staple card. We definitely want all three of those. You know, we're not going to be exhausting to thwart, so heroic intuition isn't a very interesting option. We know we're pretty much going to be taking the allies because that's what's available, though these are good allies. They're pricey, but you definitely can get a lot of value out of both of them. 
Let's go ahead and grab the basic cards. Pretty much always going to include all three doubles. I just really like Mockingbird and Nick Fury, and I really like having those. So that gets us about halfway there. Now, when it comes to the core set justice cards, they really pretty much only manage threat. There's not any variety with what's available. So we have great responsibility when any amount of threat when any amount of threat we place on a scheme, we take this damage instead. I so wish this wasn't a hero interrupt because really you're only going to be using this to prevent the one threat that's going on per turn or if they happen to draw an advance. So even though she doesn't mind taking damage, I don't really love this option. Maybe we'll come back to it. Surveillance team's pretty good. It's going to remove three threat for, you know, two costs. It's very reliable. And I like reliable threat removal. Another thing I forgot to mention with She-Hulk that is a bit of a challenge for her is she only has four hand size. So we prefer to keep the cost down in her deck if possible, though, again, options are limited in the core set. But surveillance team is nice to remove threat because it's reliable. It's going to be on the table. It's going to work every turn. You know, you might not draw into a four justice the turn that you need it. But as long as you have surveillance teams on the table, that's going to help. Interrogation Room is pretty good against Ultron. It's okay against Claw, and it's terrible against Rhino. We're going to go ahead and put it in there and just assume that you're mostly playing against Claw and Ultron because after you defeat a minion, you can exhaust or remove a threat. This is actually really good if you can trigger it reliably. And it's a cheap card. That gets us up to 16. And now this is where I might really consider grabbing these Tenacities because we want Jen to just be punching over and over and over again. Really, the theme for this Justice deck would just be manage the threat long enough for Jen to punch the villain down. So Tenacity is kind of expensive, but it is going to allow her to use her three attack more often. And it requires punch resources to trigger. And, you know, she's definitely got a few in her deck, a decent mix. And since we know we're going to be needing punch resources, I'm going to go ahead and grab these two Power of Justices. If we look at our costs here, there's three, four, five, six, seven, eight cards that cost two or more. So that tells me let's go ahead and grab both of these. The wilds will be nice for tenacity, and there's a pretty good chance we're gonna we're gonna need those. So we have four cards left. I think I really like first aid as an option here. She's gonna be damaging herself a decent amount with her focus rage. We can get these on the table to draw cards. You know, this is really, really good, but First aid is going to help you get some of that health back. And since we're not going to be blocking, other than the allies that we put in to defend for us, you know, we don't really have great survivability here. And you don't really want to be blocking with Daredevil. He's actually an ally that I think is worth getting all three of his uses out of because you're going to get, after he thwarts, you get a deal of damage. So it's going to be two thwart and a damage, two thwart and a damage, two thwart and a damage every time. So, and the first aid becomes a good option for keeping him alive as well. So I do like that one for her, but we don't need all three of them. I think two should be enough. And since we said we really just want to beat the villain down as fast as we can, we'll go ahead and grab two copies of Haymaker. You know, other than her basic activation, she doesn't actually have that much other damage in her deck. She's got the ground stomp, but that's kind of expensive for what it does. And then the Gamma Slam is there to, you know, hit the villain. So a couple Haymakers to help deal with some annoying guard minions might be nice. Hellcat also, I didn't talk much about the signature allies, but Hellcat is going to help remove some threat as well with the three, with the two thwart, so that'll be nice. All right, there's 25 cards that I think would make a pretty decent She-Hulk Justice deck. Now, again, we've got to play it, see what it does, but I feel like it should work decently well. Okay, so let's fast forward a little bit now and say that you went out and bought some cards. Next up, let's take a look at what a Doctor Strange deck in Aggression might look like in this card pool. I don't personally enjoy playing Aggression in solo very much because if you're not playing the Rush deck trying to win in three or four turns, it can be really hard to manage the board long enough to win, and I don't particularly enjoy the Rush. I like to play a game that plays out, so when I am in the mood to play Aggression, I need a hero that I can really get away with playing it with that's either strong enough or versatile enough to handle the threats that the scenario is going to put out that aggression isn't so good at managing, but still allowing me to play with the red cards that I so rarely get out. And I think Doctor Strange fits that bill. He's another one that plays really well in any aspect, mostly because he has this 
you know, these five invocation cards. They give him access to everything. He's got confuse and threat removal. He gives tough to three characters. He can draw three cards. He can deal a big damage and stun. And then his kit itself, he's got the cloak for readying. He's got resources. He's got more thwart and damage events. He's got a good ally. Just kind of has a little bit of everything. He can buff his stats if you want to go a different direction or, you know, if you're playing multiplayer, you know, this card might be useful on a different hero. He's got defensive things that can cancel treacheries. You know, he's just really got a little bit of everything. The only thing he really doesn't have is similar to Spider-Man. He has big damage, but he's not so good at little damage. He has the one attack and he has the, uh, you know, Crimson Bands is, does seven damage. You want to put that on the villain if you can. And Magic Blast costs three, so it's a little bit pricey to be taken out of minion. So he's not super good at dealing with minions, but he's pretty good at everything else. So that's another reason why I would consider building an aggression deck for him. It just fits him well, I think. He doesn't have many weaknesses, but it helps shore up what little he does have. So let's kind of grab the obvious ones that I would pretty much always consider every time I build a deck with this card pool. We're going to take the doubles. We're going to take Ironheart. And we're probably going to take Nick Fury, just because I so often do. And then if we're thinking that what we want to do is focus on being able to deal with minions, even with the bigger card pool, Relentless Assault is still a really good option. So I'm just going to grab those. We might consider Chase Them Downs just to help us with a little bit of the threat. We'll come back to that. You know, if I was playing an expert, I might consider Browbeat. But since this damage only goes on the villain, and we already have pretty good big damage for villains, maybe not so much for Doctor Strange. He also doesn't have a ton, a ton of resources. Now, if he can draw into his Winds of Watoom pretty often and draw three cards, that will certainly help. But we don't want to put too many expensive cards in his deck. You know, I'm looking at all these different attack options, and it, a lot of it is just wondering if which type of villain I'm facing. Like, do I want Piercing Strike? It just depends. I want to press the advantage. Now, this is a pretty decent option for Doctor Strange. It only does two damage, which isn't much. But if the enemy is stunned or confused, and if you're playing Doctor Strange, there's a really good chance they will be, then this might be a nice cheap option for just a little damage. Uh, I'll grab a couple of them. Since it relies on something else to also be true, in this case, the status effect, I don't necessarily need three of them in the deck. Is kind of my thinking there. Uh, we're not planning on doing our basic attack. So that's another thing. You know, I mentioned you always want to be aware of what your basic activation is likely to be. Our basic activation is likely to be exhausting for the invocation deck or probably thwarting. So we're not planning on attacking for sure. So that's not really a thing. Moment of Triumph is a decent option. This gives you health back if you really blow up a minion. So if we did use the seven damage attack on a minion, this could potentially give us a lot of health back. So that has potential. Not planning on attacking, so no combat training. Lion Waits actually a pretty decent option deals three damage for one you know what let's grab a couple of them that's that's got potential there tech team's probably a little pricey boot camp is cool if we're planning on going with a lot of allies which we'll see speaking of allies let's take a look at our options here there aren't a lot of new ones with this card pool uh, tigra is still pretty good that's her whole thing is dealing with minions now that we have a few more options, I consider Hulk to be more of a blocker than an attacker. So we're going to grab him just as a cheap blocker. He can maybe take a couple hits for us. Um, I don't really like Lady Thor that much just because she only puts damage on the villain. That's her special ability. And in solo, that's less interesting. Now, if I were playing a red multiplayer deck that was designed to just hit the villain hard, this would be a good option. But I, I don't like her that much in solo. Spider Girl's great just because she's cheap. Apparently, I have her in the sleeve upside down. So we'll definitely grab her. It's just nice to have a blocker. Now, I do like Wasp, but you have to pay for her with lightning resources. And let's just see. We've got a pretty decent amount of light. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and grab Wasp. She has a decent amount of lightning resources to choose from in the aspect. And then her the hero decks, you know, there's a few. There's a few. Especially on Magical Enhancements. This is a card I don't really like to play in solo anyway, and it has lightning, so... That's something to consider. So that gave us one, two, three. And then of course we always have Ironheart and Nick, four, five. So we, that's that's probably a good number of allies. I don't have a hard and fast rule at all about how many allies I put in. 
But five is a, kind of a nice round number since you're pretty much planning on using them to block for you. you get a little bit of use out of them. So that's that. Now, if we look at our basic options, going to skip past most of these. Ah, that's right. Now we're playing a mystic. Spiritual Meditation is pretty much an auto-include with any of the mystic heroes for zero, draw two cards, and discard a card. That's just so, so, so good. Now, Earth's Mightiest Heroes is a potentially interesting option. It allows you to exhaust an Avenger to ready another Avenger. And Doctor Strange wants to exhaust to play his spells. So if we have a decent amount of Avengers allies, we have one, two, three. Well, we have three. We could consider trying to get a couple more in there, though. Earth's Mightiest Heroes. I'll keep that to the side. That might be interesting. Just seeing if there's any more interesting basic cards. Tenacity continues to be too expensive. Sorcerer Supreme is an obvious auto-include with Doctor Strange. That free card every single turn you're in hero form is just... So good. Now, anytime you're playing an Avenger and you own a Quinn Carrier, you pretty much want to grab one. Just getting another resource every turn is so good, and the Wild could help pay for Wasp anyway. Team building exercise isn't that interesting. We don't have that many Avengers. Okay, how many cards is that? All right, so that gets us to 20. Just kind of looking over, so we've got a few allies. We have a lot of decent small damage now. We might consider adding a little bit of threat removal, what little there is in aggression. Yeah, I think I'm gonna go ahead and grab, basically our options at this point with this card pool are chase them down and into the fray. Chase them down obviously is cheaper and removes two into the fray is expensive, but it deals damage to a minion, and it could potentially remove some. It just depends on how big the minion was. Considering doing a mix of both, actually, you know, it, it sort of depends on the villain, depending on which kind of minions there's going to be, is which card to use. But just for general purpose, I really like just a couple chase and downs in solo can be really useful. And I'm going to grab one into the fray. I think it's fine to grab just a one of every now and then of something that situationally useful. It's not something we're counting on, but if we have it in our hand at the right time, I think it's totally okay to have a card in your deck or two like that. That gets us to 23. But one thing we want to be thinking about is our resources. So we have one, two, three, four, five. We have six red cards that cost two or more. That tells me I, we're kind of right on the brink of whether or not we need the power of aggression. Now we have quite a bit of card filtering with spiritual meditation as well as the, uh, you know, we're going to be able to play Winds of a Tomb a few times. going to let us draw a lot of cards too. What that's going to do is let us match up our resource cards. So let's go ahead and grab just one. We don't want to be drawing into too many resources. And you know, when in doubt, if I can't think of another card, Mockingbird is always worth bringing. So that is 25 cards. This is a Doctor Strange deck I think I would really enjoy. Now, I did end up, I had these aside. Yeah, I think you could definitely build a Doctor Strange deck that wants to use these cards. But you probably want a few more Avengers allies just to really make good use of them. So I decided not to go that route. Otherwise, I think this looks like it would be pretty fun. If we go with Scarlet Witch in justice so say you're playing a three or four player game and it's going to be your job to manage the threat how would we build a deck that goes with that the philosophies are actually pretty different because you know before we were so focused on trying to have all the effects you want access to a little bit of everything and especially shoring up your hero's weaknesses when you're playing in multiplayer it really gives you the freedom to lean into your hero's strengths. Even in two players, you could sort of do that. Think of this as more three or four player. And then for two player, it's kind of a, a little bit of, it's still mostly what I was saying before with the other examples, but maybe, you know, you could ignore one element of the game a little bit more and let the other player handle that. But in three or four players, you know, you've got one job to do. And in this particular example, it's going to be removing threat. So we want to know what Wanda's good at. 
and she's kind of pretty good at everything. She's got really good access to status effects, which makes her really nice for multiplayer. She's going to be able to stun and confuse the villain, which is going to help the whole table. She's got magic shield, which could do some defense. Molecular Decay does some big damage. And so she can do a little bit of everything. And certainly threat removal is one of them. But when building for multiplayer, we want to really include a lot of whatever it is we're supposed to be doing. You know, we're supposed to be removing threat. So we're going to grab the best threat removal cards, like For Justice. And now that we have this bigger card pool, we have access to Clear the Area, which is one of the best threat removal cards. Now, one thing that's interesting about Clear the Area is in three or four player, it might be less of an interesting option because it wants to be removing the last threat on a scheme. And maybe in three or four players, it's a little hard to guarantee that's going to happen. But we're still definitely going to at least add it as a consideration. Uh, something else I might consider in multiplayer that I wouldn't normally think of for solo play is Crisis Averted because it's kind of pricey and it removes such a big chunk of threat. But this is where the difference between solo and multiplayer comes into play you're far more likely to have a big chunk of threat. Either, you know, side schemes come out with 6, 12, 18, however much threat, a lot. And so this is going to help you remove that kind of threat. You're never going to have six threat to remove in solo, or at least, you know, not as often. Uh, so I would definitely consider grabbing these for a threat removal. And then as far as other effects go... You know, I think those are probably the best options. Multitasking, actually, there's a good chance this will make it in instead of clear the area. As nice as it is to draw that card with clear the area, multitasking is going to have a lot of targets and might be more useful in the end. Turn the Tide is a really good solo card, but this is where, you know, it's not your job to deal damage. And Wanda already has decent damage just within her kit. So you're not necessarily looking to add more to your deck for multiplayer. But something you might consider is Skilled Investigator. Now, I only grabbed one for my... Uh, cards to work through here but you know you can put up to three of these in your deck and you can play them under any player's control and that's something we haven't talked about because we've been talking about solo decks but you want to be passing these out so i would actually put three of those in your deck heroic intuition becomes an interesting option now since you're most likely going to be exhausting to thwart so you're going to get an extra thwart out of that every turn uh, some of the old options like interrogation room and surveillance team are a little less Interesting just because we have better cards now. And then as far as our allies go, it's probably more just about having some cheap blockers for yourself. Wiccan is always a good option, just uh, any any two-cost ally, really. Which there aren't a lot of injustice with this particular card pool, it seems. So Spider-Man would also be an option just because is after you play him, you get to remove three per player from a side scheme. So again... If you're playing three or four players, that's definitely huge, and it's not something I would play in solo, so you probably want to grab it. And maybe Jessica Jones as well. Daredevil might be a little pricey for what you're trying to do here. Of course, we're going to grab our doubles when it comes to the basics. We're playing a Mystic, so we definitely want the Spiritual Meditations. Uh, we don't really care about readying. A lot of these we're going to just skip past. You're definitely going to find, once you start building a lot of decks, that there's just certain cards you know you like using, and Certain ones you don't, so Sorcerer Supreme definitely comes along. Uh, we probably want a Quinn Carrier. Another strength of Wanda is that you always want to think about, and this is just specific to this hero, but you always want to be thinking about this hero. Oh, I already have the three resource cards. We'll just set those aside. Is she has this... Uh, where is it? Chaos Magic that lets her play a card from her hand, ignoring its cost. So it's always good to grab some expensive cards to go along with that. So certainly the Mansion would be good, and the Quinn Carrier is just always nice. Like I said, I pretty much always play Ironheart, and I pretty much always play Nick Fury. And since, especially because she could potentially play Nick Fury for free with that Chaos Magic, that's just such a no-brainer. So one thing you've probably noticed, this is, the I don't know, the, the seventh deck I've built, for this video is I do tend to use a lot of the same cards and decks and, and you know that's that's just a card game thing I think or maybe that's just a me thing but some cards are just better than others so it's totally I think it's totally okay if you know you just use a lot of the same cards every card game has staples there are very good cards that you want to bring along a lot 
So, but you know, you could just choose not to. You could just choose not to play with Nick Fury just just because. So let's see one, two, three. All right, so we actually have 28 cards of our 25. And the first thing I would do, well, we should put two more skilled investigators in, but I don't have those handy. So let's say we're at 30. We need to get rid of five cards because I just, I don't like going over 40 personally. So the first thing I would probably get rid of are these clear the areas. If you're playing three or four player, just small threat removal is just less interesting. You want to be able to reliably remove big chunks of threat because you're going to be putting three or four on the main scheme every turn at least, plus, you know, if any side schemes pop out. Uh, some other ones, if I need to remove two more cards still, I might consider removing... You know, we don't really have a plan for keeping ourselves alive. That's one thing I talked a lot about in the last video. It's one of the key pillars of building a solo deck. Now, in multiplayer, the hope is you might have someone else to help you, or at least a chump blocker, but it's good to have at least some idea. Now, she has some good blockers like Nick Fury and Ironheart, Wiccan, and then she has the Magic Shield, so she's probably okay for defense. So just kind of looking at how to trim this deck down... I might consider taking out one Crisis Averted. You know, you don't want to overdo it on threat removal. And even though that is your job, you still... There is such a thing as doing too much of one thing, even in multiplayer. And then, if I had to take out one more card... Oh, plus, we didn't think about the, the resources I forgot about. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven... We have nine yellow cards... Tells me we want at least one power of justice, possibly two. She draws a lot of cards, so let's just go with the one. So now we need to remove two more cards. I think I'd probably take out Heroic Intuition. It's really not that big of a deal to be able to thwart for one more every turn. This is far more useful in solo, I think, uh, if you're going to be thwarting. So we probably take that out. And maybe one of the multitaskings. So if we had three skilled investigators in there to pass around to other people, that gets us up to 25. And what this does is this gives us a pretty good base for threat removal. You know, we should be able to reasonably remove threat every turn. You know, we've got our nice card draw. We've got a lot of really reliable allies. They're going to help in various ways. Skill investigators are going to help out the rest of the team. And then just coupled with her massive damage potential, she's got a little bit of defense to help out with, and she's got uh, the status effects that are going to help the whole table. This, I think, would be a really, really solid Justice multiplayer deck. And you would do the same thing if you were building, say, aggression, if you were the damage dealer, you know, you would just take a lot of the same cards that are just going to work well in general. But then instead of having to worry about shoring up your weaknesses, you would just take more damage. You know, you just put a lot of damage in your deck. If you were playing protection, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about removing threat, which is normally your weakness. You would just take a lot of cards that would help you ready to continue to defend for the whole table. So, I don't feel like I need to do a lot of multiplayer examples just because it's it's pretty straightforward on how to build a multiplayer deck. Just do a lot of the main thing that your job is, and it should work out just fine. Okay, and with that, I am out of the deck building video business. My original idea for this video was only going to be one, then it became two, then it became three, and then somehow it turned into four. But if you've made it all the way through all four of these deck building videos, especially this one that maybe is a little bit more than what you were looking for, I just want to thank you so much for joining me. And this time I actually mean it when I say next time we're going to be talking about modular encounter sets, which I'm very excited about. If you'd be so kind to like the video and subscribe to the channel, that would be very helpful and I would appreciate it. And I want to thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.